to the Clackamas County Board of Commissioners issues and updates on this August 14, 2024. Nancy Bush, your acting county administrator today, <clears throat> and you're up. Yes, thank you, Chair. So first, we have a presentation from the City of Gladstone on the Urban Renewal Plan Amendments. We have Mayor Michael Milch and Elaine Howard coming up to give that presentation. Um, this is to let you, this is for an update to you and for you to provide feedback to uh, the City of Gladstone. There is no decision to be made by the board today. Thank you. Welcome. Please introduce yourselves. I'm Elaine Howard, consultant to the City of Gladstone and Gladstone Urban Renewal Agency. I'm Michael Milch, Mayor of Gladstone. Go Thank ahead. Thanks for having us. I believe we have a side, slide presentation. The City of Gladstone established an urban renewal agency more than three decades ago. The initial designated area included a large undeveloped acreage adjacent to I-205 that some people thought could become another freeway accessible, large-scale mixed-use retail development similar to Clackamas Town Center. Most of the remaining acreage at that time was school district campuses with plans to fund shared recreation facilities that would benefit the community at large. The shopping mall project never materialized. That land is now the conference headquarters for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. But over the years, urban renewal did help fund the high school sports facility and sidewalks and other infrastructure that supported housing growth and safe walkability near local schools. The most recent and, and most major project uh, using our urban renewal district in Gladstone was the funding uh, about four or five years ago or more of our combined city hall and police station facility. The funding of that building on um, what I would describe as blighted industrial land uh, enabled us to uh, add improved facilities in a residential area that's central to the city. Also freed up land that was uh, uh, designated to be the site of the county library. So uh, for the city, it was a win-win on both counts because uh, we got uh, city facilities, improved and need, long needed city facilities in an important area. And uh, the county got land for the library that would serve our, our district. Now, I understand that some of you have never met uh, an urban renewal agency that you didn't hate, huh. uh, but there's always a first time. Gladstone is pursuing the value capture mechanism of tax increment financing for at least two reasons. First, because it provides a targeted method to finance infrastructure benefiting the specific area of the city within which we, we believe has the highest potential for development. And second, because we believe such investments will generate private investment in the area, which will more widely benefit the city and the surrounding region. It will provide employment opportunities, shopping and other amenities, much needed housing development at varied price points, and a more robust and diverse tax base. Gladstone doesn't have vacant land for outward expansion and growth, but we are confident that the expanded tax base created by downtown revitalization and redevelopment will capture new revenue for taxing districts as a result of these city financed infrastructure investments. Elaine will share a little bit of the specifics of some of the numbers involved uh, so that, uh, and you have that in your, in your packet as well. So the proposed plan amendment is to expand the boundary of the urban renewal area to encompass the properties that are adjacent to Portland Avenue. The avenue itself was already in the urban renewal area. The properties adjacent to it were not. This expansion meets the limitations required in ORS 457 not to expand beyond 20% of the original acreage, so it falls within that. There have been some previous uh, additions, and then this addition would be about 21.5 acres, leaving a remaining capacity for boundary additions in the future of only about six acres. Okay, next slide. This shows the proposed boundary addition, and you can see the new properties to be added are shown in the gold, so it is those properties adjacent to Portland Avenue. 
Those are properties uh, where the city has recently upgraded the zoning to allow mixed use development within that area. And we need infrastructure to be put in to allow for that mixed use development to occur and potentially incentives to work with developers to make sure that they get the density of development that is desired along that corridor to allow for that higher density housing, which we all need throughout Oregon. Next slide. You are, uh, of course, most interested, I believe, on the impacts on the different taxing districts. This plan amendment would take the urban renewal area and extend it by four years from fiscal year in 2030, which was the projected termination date, to fiscal year end 2034. That maximum indebtedness increase is the statutory limit amount that's allowed of 20% of the original maximum indebtedness as increased by inflation over the time that it was originally established. So that new maximum indebtedness amount would, I'm gonna pull up my uh, report, is bringing the total maximum indebtedness figure to 33 million 800,000. Um, much of that maximum indebtedness that they had originally has been used. So there is a remaining amount of the original maximum indebtedness and then this added capacity would allow for the new projects within the plan. Those projects um, specifically are infrastructure improvements and uh, property potential property acquisition. That property acquisition, if used, would allow the Urban Renewal Agency to help make sure that what gets developed on that property in the future meets the goals of the city in terms of a mixed use, high density um, development. So next, uh, I think, well, let's just go, let's go back to that, I'm sorry. So this just looks at the total amounts of impact of the urban renewal area from now till the end on the different taxing districts. I'm sorry, that <clears throat> pulled you out of your development. So for the city of Gladstone, the impacts are about $5.3 million. For Clackamas County, um, it's uh, 2.7 million, County 4-H and Extension, 55,000, County Library, 442,000, and County Soil and Conservation, about 55,000. Uh, 55, so these are impacts not only of finishing the existing maximum indebtedness, but also of adding the new maximum indebtedness to the area. And again, it is projected that that maximum indebtedness would be reached in fiscal year in 2034. After this amendment, if passed, the agency does not have capacity to ever increase the maximum indebtedness again under present statutes. This is the last increase that could be allowed for the area. Okay, is that it, presentation? Uh, it I is. think we have some questions. Commissioner West. Uh, thank you. Um, help me understand, uh, is, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't mean to get your name, is it Elaine? Elaine. Thank you for your presentation. I just have a few questions. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna start with, um, uh, what, is, what percentage of Gladstone is in a renewable district today? And what is the maximum allowed within the city limits? The maximum allowed is 25% of total acreage. And I will look at my section of the report that has that acreage. Sorry. No problem, take your time. Um, right now, with this amendment, there would be 13.1% of the acreage in an urban renewal area, so well below that 25%, okay. and only 3.8% of the assessed value is okay. in the urban renewal area. Okay, thank you, that, that's a, that really helps me. Um, uh, 
One of my questions was, and I think you alluded to this, I just want some clarification. Is I, I, My question was, when does the original urban renewal district sunset? It sounded like it was 2030. Yeah, there wasn't an exact sunset date, but It'd the be financial paid projections off, right? were that the final debt would be paid off in fiscal year in 2030. And then tax districts like ourselves, the fire, Clackamas Fire, other, other entities, the school district that... Um, are not receiving this revenue from property taxes. Um, they're basically foregoing those for this improvement. Um, that would that would they would start seeing those revenues come back to their coffers in 2034. 2035. 2035. Thank you. And the fire district. Um, are they signed off on it? Is very minimally impacted by this. There is uh, and your assessor has changed the information. Uh, that there were two properties that were incorrectly coded that caused the fire district to be impacted. The assessor has gone through and changed the coding on those properties so they won't be impacted in the future. Thank you for that explanation. We just saw a large urban renewal opportunity go before the voters of Oregon City. Mm -hmm. And um, whether we like the project or not, they resoundingly said, nope, we don't want that. Um, so we respect the voters there. I'm curious if Gladstone requires something like urban renewal, though it's complicated still to go before the voters of their community, or is this a decision that the council can make on their own? The city council may make this on their own. Okay, thank you for the, does the city just plan to at least go to an advisory vote, similar to like the history of Wilsonville, and at least go to the citizens and get their thoughts on this before they make the decision, considering oh, the mayor. local controversy around their... Um, urban renewal and the impact on local taxing districts? We'll have hearings before the Planning Commission. We'll have an opportunity for a lot of public input through the general process that leads to a council vote. We have, do, we have some provisions in our city charter that require votes of the citizens on uh, building projects that cost in excess of a million dollars. If the city were to uh, acquire some property and then plan to uh, uh, build a project as part of this process ourselves or, or seek out a developer to do it. It may come under that provision, uh, but that would mostly be not so much for the establishment and, and amendment, amendment of the district itself, but for the use of the funds uh, for development uh, at the city level. Yeah. We're anticipating primarily private development, uh, or at most a public-private partnership. Um, we really want to get new dollars into the city, expand the tax base, and increase uh, the, the revenues uh, following the, uh, the end of the district. Mayor, I'd just like to clarify, part of the project, depending on how property is acquired, may go before the voters, but you're not anticipating taking urban renewal as a financing mechanism before the voters? Correct. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Um, and then my last question, and then I'll give up um, the floor here, um, or my comment is, I am curious, maybe with staff, we've had a number of urban renewal projects come before us, a huge one in West Lynn. Um, they've been trying to do one in other areas of our uh, of, um, of Clackamas County. We're facing some different financial times and crunches to our general fund. I am curious about how this is all adding up as we are, um, you know, a taxing district that's impacted by this potentially heavily. This is another few million dollars that we're not gonna see in revenue here in the county. This seems to be adding up, Chair. I'm just concerned about the price tag. As a county, I need to keep my eyes on that. I'm neutral to your project. It sounds like it would be wonderful in your community, but some of these financial impacts as you know, a neighboring partner and governmental entity that works with y'all, um, we feel these impacts over time and it takes you know 30 years just before we start seeing any revenue back to help our local communities too um, and the rest of the county. So. I am just keeping a close eye on that. I'd love to see a tally on where we're at as a county, and that's all I have, Chair. How far would you like to go back on the urban renewal that's been done? I mean, just since I've been chair, there's been several. Um, and you make a good point. You know, the people who are coming before us who won tax races are also the same entities that come before us that want our general fund to do projects. And it's... It's not fair, at the very least. We don't have a vote here today, but we can voice our opinion on it. Do you understand the, what the 
request is on yes, how much urban so. renewal. Because we have West Lynn's coming, that's large. It hasn't hit us yet, but it's going to. We have this request, and not, not that these aren't noble and good projects that we want to see done in our community. So you want a snapshot in I'd time. love, yeah, like where the cost has maybe historically hit us, an idea of that. And then like what we're looking projected out would be interesting because it is expensive to school districts and to counties and to fire districts and to all these other districts that we have to, you know, forego these anticipated revenues um, over a long period of time. These projects aren't free, right? And so um, it is complicated. Renewal is very complicated or TIF financing is very complicated. I think sometimes it is a very useful tool and a necessary. I have voted for it at times in my own community and, and other times no. Uh, but I just think that I need to know as a commissioner, like what is my impact in the role for the county or how is it impacting our county right now and then looking forward? Thank you. Okay. Is that it? Yeah, I'm done. Commissioner Shaw. Yes, good morning, Mayor. Ma'am, um, welcome to Clackamas County, or actually you're in Clackamas County, but welcome to uh, uh, the board here this morning. Uh, okay, first question is, uh, as I look at your map for your proposed uh, expansion, it uh, looks like there's at least about 100 tax lots there. Are most of them commercial or are they residential? It is a mixture. Uh, north of... Uh, Dartmouth Street, they tend to be more residential than okay. commercial. Uh, the main current uh, retail district, if you want to call it that, is, are the uh, two or three blocks at, at the south end of Portland Avenue. I see. But okay. some, some uh, commercial expansion is happening farther north. We also have um, doctor's office, chiropractors, dentists, lawyers, things like that along there. So it is it's very mixed okay. uh, right now. Okay. So with this expansion, ultimately, the number of residential projects or uh, housing units will be increased. Some people might have to uh, lose their, their home to make way for expansion, but overall, the net result would be an increase in resi residential units in this area, correct? That is our hope. That, okay. uh, and, and perhaps it would be some sort of underused commercial property converted to residential. Okay, uh, I, as well. I see. And then what is the overall opinion of the residents of Gladstone on this? Is it, do you have a consensus? Are they excited about it? I think the, you know, we're, we're about uh, a couple of weeks away from completion of the brand new library that yeah. the county has built for us in Gladstone, which will be uh, a centerpiece, uh, a foundational cornerstone of that downtown area. The city is very excited about that. And uh, with some, uh, you know, we've laid the groundwork by having a downtown revitalization plan that started seven years ago, or the plan was mm -hmm. adopted then. We've recently made zoning changes. You know, as you know, the pandemic slowed down a lot of this whole process. But we've made the zoning changes to allow for more development. And properties which sat vacant and uh, undeveloped for uh, almost a decade are now being snatched up by potential developers who see the potential for this kind of uh, growth in mixed use development. So uh, it, it, the timing is right for us to make this investment uh, in that region. Okay, well, um, the, uh, the issue regarding the reduction of property taxes for a period of time, should this expansion happen. Uh, looks to me like that is not a bad investment because your city does need a new revitalization um, to bring in new business, new residential projects. Um, it's going to be a big boost. And you're doing a lot of good things along Portland Avenue now. And so I think this is, it looks like a good investment for the county. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner Savas. Yeah, well, hello again, Elaine. Hi. <laughs> You're back, Mayor, good to see you. Um, yeah, my experience has been um, that this is probably one of the most misunderstood um, mechanisms, tools that there, uh, I've experienced in government. And um, I have seen urban renewal districts be highly successful, and we are the benefactor of that here in Clackamas County. I've seen some that did not do so well. They were more, more flailed. Um, so um, 
you know, the other thing too is that having the city or the future elected officials having the discipline to carry the plan out in the future, right? I mean, that's also part of this whole thing. But it sounds like um, with the um, charter requirements to put something on the ballot of a certain size, um, those larger projects are um, going to be subject to a vote, perhaps. The smaller scale projects, not. So, you know, if, if that gives people comfort, great. Um, I can see that also being a limiting factor as well um, in what you can do. Um, you know, the other thing too is, and I studied this, I studied the math um, way back and trying to, and again, that's where I learned that some, some um, urban rural districts have done the county very good and also the local areas very well. My concern, um, and that is because of the, my sensitivity to some of the lower income populations that live in Gladstone is displacement, right? That if on one hand it's a yin and the yang, right? You bring up the assessed value at the same token, maybe that creates a development that prices people out of the homes or their properties or whatnot that they currently have. So that delicate balance will take discipline and thoughtfulness to make sure that you, those, those affordable properties today, even though you could argue that not, nothing's affordable today for in housing, but uh, that they're somehow maintained and protected somehow. So I, you know, I don't see any detail to that effect in what I read, um, but I, I hope that we do that uh, or that you all you know, factor that in to that. I, and I, you don't need our approval. Um, and obviously the fire districts typically that uh, have lobbied, it sounds like you re remedied that. So um, I don't see a large impact to, um, the county per se, and hopefully we'll see a benefit, right? That's what so, our hope is, yeah. yes. <laughs> so it's not about how perhaps we're affecting the community, it's, it's ideally in urban rules, how the community will be affected in a, hopefully ideally a positive way. So thanks for bringing this forward. I, I hopeful, I hopeful that we're all successful with this. Thank you, Commissioner Schrader. Yeah, I mean, uh, my attitude is, is this, I, I've always liked urban renewal because I've seen what it can do long term. So I would like to get, a, I don't know, Nancy, if it's possible to get an estimate from other urban renewal entities in this county to see how much added value was added back that may or may not have been there, mm -hmm. um, true. including our own urban renewal. Because you, you are for, foregoing, you know, dollars in the immediate sense, but, if you're thinking long term, adding the value back is going to raise everybody's, you know, boat in a way. So is that available? Anything like that? Has, oh, has I think it probably it? could be. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, I'd like to see if we could get that mm -hmm. information. That's fair. Yeah, that's fair. Yep. I, is that it, Martha? Yep. Yeah. What I'd like to say about City of Gladstone, I think you're one of the more unique cities in Clackamas County because you're really constrained geographically for growth. So, you know I don't like urban renewal because I don't like it takes money away from all the people who are dependent on it and that's one of the reasons why the school fund at the state legislature has grown so much because they keep needing to backfill the urban renewal takeaways from probably a lot of cities, especially the larger school districts in the state of Oregon, and that's just one example, okay? So people probably shouldn't complain about how big our state school fund is if they would go do an analysis that we've asked for here today of all the money being taken away. I understand your, greed, your need for growth. I understand you're constrained for that. I'm concerned that you're doing this on top of another urban renewal district that is not yet expired. I, I don't think that's good business practices because whereas you also have some skin in the game based on the chart that, that came up, City of Gladstone's foregoing revenue also. Your revenue sources are already limited, I would think, because my understanding of how cities make money is building new properties and the permitting process that the permit fees and the SDCs go into your coffers, which is fine. I'm not against that. And if you have an urban renewal district where tax abatements are given or TIF or whatever you want to call it, then you could make money on that. So I think it's, it's a give and a take on that. 
and um, we're not voting on this today, but I am concerned that, that you're moving ahead on this when there's still another outstanding uh, district available. Commissioner Scholl. Yeah, well, I was, Mr. Mayor, I was gonna say that the existing urban Reno district you have has no sunset on it, correct? Correct. Yeah, it's not, it doesn't have a deadline, it doesn't have a sunset. So this, this new idea you have for expansion of it seems to be, in my mind, um, perfectly uh, reasonable. And also, I'd like to add, you know, when it comes to uh, charting the, the future of a city, who is more uh, in a better position to look at that but the mayor, the city council, and the people that live there. And if this is what they want, I think the investment, um, $2.6 million in reduction in property taxes is very reasonable. And again, this should not be about property taxes coming into the county. It should be about what is best for the future of our cities, for the people that live there. And like has been mentioned earlier, in time, this will all come back. This investment will come back in the form of uh, greater property taxes, uh, something that we, not all of us like, but it will be a good investment for the city of Gladstone and for Clackamas County. Thank you. Any other comments, commissioners? Mayor and um, Eileen, Irene, excuse me, thank you for your presentation today. It was very informative. Um, we are not voting, but I appreciate you coming in and presenting the information to us. Thank you for sharing your perspective with us. Commissioner West, Commissioner Schrader, um, I think uh, I, I'm not aware of the extent to which you already have uh, other districts, other cities uh, pulling on, on at, yeah. at your funds. So it's good to hear that perspective from you because I'm not just a resident of a city, I'm a resident of the county too. Okay. And I want the good programs that the county offers to be adequately funded. So um, I'm glad we have this process of give and take. Uh, and uh, Commissioner Scholl, I appreciate your confidence in the city to be able to put these monies to good use. So thank you very much for allowing us to be here. Uh, Commissioner West. Yeah, Mayor, I, I, I'm, I'm, I, th I might be the only one on this board that at a city level has, has looked at these projects, voted on these projects. In my own community in Wilsonville, Wilsonville has a much larger percentage of its acreage that is utilized for urban renewal. It's, you're, you guys have so, seem to be using it very judiciously. Um, I just want to be a good watchdog of the process is why I asked the questions that I asked. My own neighborhood I live in, which is now vastly more valuable than it was be, be, once they tore down Damish and was like just a bunch of open fields, um, is worth hundreds of millions of dollars more than it ever would have been without the only mechanism was urban renewal to build the infrastructure out there. So I'm not opposed to urban renewal. I just want to make sure that we're using it very cautiously and judiciously in this county. I agree with Commissioner Savas that sometimes it it has been good and sometimes it's been a nightmare um, and misused and so we just have to be careful with that and I think you guys by all intents are doing that here but um, thank you you know from one local elected to another for your advocacy here for your city thank you You're all right thank you very thank much you. for coming forward Nancy what's up next yes thank you so we're going to go into our issues and updates we'll start with our consent agenda items and chair I need you <coughs> to uh, convene as the housing Authority of Clackamas County, please. I will recess as the Board of County Commissioners and convene as a housing authority of Clackamas County. And before we get started, is Ann Leister on? Ann Leister is not on. Okay, Ann, time. welcome. All right. Is she Thank you. there yet? So first item up is approval of resolution 1993, appointing Shannon Callahan as the executive director of the housing authority of Clackamas County. No fiscal impact, no county general funds are involved. Rod? Good morning, commissioners. Um, as you're aware, Tony Carter retired on May 2nd, 2024. At that time, the recruitment process for the new director for HCD, or housing, was in its final stages. However, HAC bylaws mandated the appointment of a new ED, or exec executive director, to ensure the continuity of operations. Chris Ayosa was appointed as the interim executive director by this board at that time. Uh, since then, <clears throat> Shannon Callahan beca began the role of director of the Housing Depart Division on June 10, 2024, 
we request that the board appoint Shen Callahan, the newly hired director of the Housing and Community Development Division, as the executive director of HAC, executive effective August 1st, 2024. Uh, she is prepared to accept the responsibilities uh, before her. Welcome, please introduce yourself. Uh, thank you, Chair and Commissioners. I'm Shannon Callahan. Um, as Rod indicated, I am the new director of the Housing and Community Development Division. And I am uh, very grateful for this opportunity to serve Clackamas County. I know how um, important housing and homelessness are to your recovery-oriented system of care, and I look forward to working with you all to advance that work. Well, um, I think it's great you're here. Thank you. You look like you're ready to go. Any further comments from commissioners today? Commissioner Scholl? Yes, well, welcome. And uh, congratulations on this. This is uh, a huge job. The Housing Authority of Clackamas County is probably one of the most busy housing authorities in the state. And uh, again, congratulations. Uh, do we need a motion on this? No, we don't, Tony. Ann Leinstra, are you online and would you like to comment? No, she is not. I thought you said she was. Apologies, no, she Chair, is she is not. Okay, misunderstood. Well, um, so we do not need an approval of this, is that correct? No, Chair, this would be consent agenda on Thursday. Or okay, all righty, thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome. Right. Okay, item number two, approval of a revenue grant agreement with the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development to administer rental assistance for the Shelter Plus Care Program. Total grant value is $644,088 for one year. Funding is through the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, and the 25% match requirement is met through the Metro Supporting Ho Supportive Housing Services Fund investments. No county general funds are involved. Yes, this is a, another revenue grant agreement from the, uh, from the Continuum of Care Consolidated application submitted in 2023. It funds the rental assistance portion of the shelter, shelter Plus Care program. It includes funding to cover administrative costs to administer, administer the program, and supportive housing services investments cover the, 20, the, cover the required 25% match in funds. Uh, the Shelter Care Plus program is a federally funded permanent supportive housing initiative that links homeless adults and low-income families with disabilities to permanent housing. Questions or comments? Seeing no objections. Okay, item number three. Approval to apply for a multifamily initiative package from the PGD, PGE Renewable Development Fund to promote sustainable building systems at the Hillside Park Redevelopment Project. The grant value is up to $350,000, and funding is through the state funding. No county general funds are involved. Yes, the Hillside Park site is in the Milwaukee Redevelopment Project creates a safe, healthy, and secure community by replacing 100 units of near obsolete public housing and increasing affordable housing units. This is, this is a request to apply for up to $350,000 in multifamily incentive funding from the PGE Renewable Development Fund. The grant will promote sustainable building systems at Hillside Park, reducing operational energy and utility costs. Commissioner Shaw. Yes, uh, Mr. Cook, on this particular item, if this is approved, what is the potential cost over and above this particular grant for the adding to the cost of this project on Hillside, um, Hillside Park Redevelopment Project? Okay. In other words, by accepting this, we get 350K to do this renewable energy thing, but what other costs are going to be associated with this? Are we getting ourselves into a more costly development? Uh, Commissioner, this, uh, if we applied and received this grant, this would allow us to do additional work that we would not otherwise do. Um, so there would be no additional cost okay. to the development. Um, we would not proceed with doing these, uh, the solar array and battery backup if we did not receive this grant. Okay, thank you. For the questions, seeing no objections. All right, thank you. 
Next up is Water Environmental Services. So Chair, if you would please adjourn as a Housing Authority and reconvene as the Water Environmental Services District. I will adjourn as a Housing Authority of Clackamas County and convene as Water Environment Services. All right, thank you. So item number one, one approval of FY 2023-24 report in lieu of audit form for Clackamas County Service District number one. Filing fee is $20. Funding is through Wes's Sanitary Sewer and Service Water Operating Funds. No county general funds are involved, and we have um, Wes up here. Thank you. Good morning, directors. Uh, Greg Geist, Director Wes. Um, so this is something we've been doing for a few years now. When we formed the West 190 Partnership, all of the assets were transferred into that entity. But the other three entities, the uh, Clackamas County Service District Number 1, the Tri-City Service District, and the Surface Water Management Agency of Clackamas County still exist as legal entities. So what we do is every year we file um, a report in lieu of audit um, saying that there's no financial activity in either of those three districts. It's pretty straightforward. Okay. Questions or comments? Seeing no objections. <coughs> Item number two, approval of a FY 23-24 report in lieu of audit form for Tri-City Service District. Filing fee is $20. Funding is through West's Sanitary Sewer Operating Funds. No county general funds are involved. Same thing. I would just add that combined, this saves us several thousand, eight thousand dollars, I think, a year to do this instead of having our auditors do the work. Questions or comments? Seeing no objections. Item number three, approval of FY2324 report in lieu of audit form for Service Water Management Agency of Clackamas County. Filing fee is $20. Funding is through West's Service Water Operating Funds. No county general funds are involved. Same thing. Same thing. <laughs> uh, questions or comments? See no objection. Item number four, approval of a contract with Braun Construction and Design LLC for services necessary to complete the Azar SE 108th drainage project. Contract value is $183,613.75. Funding is through West Service Water Construction Funds. No county general funds are involved. Thank you. Um, so you won't often see West come here and say we want to put a pipe in where there's a, a natural drainage, uh, but this one is a, a unique situation. We've got stormwater pipe upstream of this location and downstream. It's, it's 230 feet, um, kind of in the middle of a system that is daylighted, um, has been since the 90s. We have serious erosion problems. Uh, we hired an engineer to come in and look at it, and they said we need to put in a 24-inch pipe, and, and that's it. Okay, questions, comments? Um, how much of this is being paid for with SDC fees? I don't believe any of it. Okay, so it's coming out of the surface water program? Yes. Okay. See no objections, thank you. Item number five, approval of a grant agreement with Oregon Water Resources Department for Water Conservation, Reuse and Storage, grant value is $75,000. Match funding is through West Sanitary Sewer Operating Funds. No county general funds are involved. Greg? Thank you. So as you know, we make very beautiful, clean water out of our membrane bioreactor facility on our treatment plant. Uh, we use a lot of that water uh, right, instead of potable water inside the fence, we call it, uh, irrigation, as well as for our process. Um, we think that we have a, a excess water that we could use in other ways for landscape irrigation outside the fence, uh, flushing toilets, things like that. So um, part of that water we know we need to meet our regulatory requirements. Uh, we mix that with the effluent that comes from the other side, our our older side of the treatment plant, that goes out to the river, makes nice clean water for the river. Uh, we're trying to figure out how much we have to play with, <laughs> essentially, and, and when that, that water is available, so that we can then start working with partners outside to make that water available for beneficial reuse for the community. Questions or comments? Seeing no objections. <clears throat> Thank you, Greg. So, Chair, please adjourn as the Water Environmental Services and convene as the Service District Number 5 for street lighting. I will adjourn as a Water Environment Services and convene as Service District Number 5 street lighting. All right, so we have Cheryl Bell here today. First the item is approval of a board resolution certifying the 2024-25 assessment role for the Clackamas County Service District Number 5. Total values.
two billion. Is that right? Three hundred fifteen. No, I'm sorry, two million three hundred fifty. I'm sorry, two million three hundred fifteen thousand one hundred nineteen dollars and eighty cents. Funding is through ratepayers. No county general funds are involved. Very interesting, Smith and Commissioners. You'll notice I'm not Dan Johnson. Uh, he's out ill today, so Sarah and I are going to be covering these um, issues and in, in requests for consent today. So before you, it's for, this is for the lighting district. State statute requires the board to certify the roles of the lighting district and provide this information to the assessor. Staff are asking for the um, board to approve this resolution to take these actions. The roles in this resolution were included in the FY2425 approved budget. So I think it's important to note here the rates for um, the lighting district in this resolution remain flat. There was no fee increase in this um, resolution. So we're requesting your approval of this um, resolution. Questions or comments? See no objections. All right, thank you, Cheryl. Awesome, thank you. So Chair, with you please adjourn as the service district number five and convene as the Board of County Commissioners. I will recess as service district number five and reconvene as a Board of County Commissioners. Nancy. Okay, next up we have um, the Sheriff's Office. So first up is approval of a contract with Bridges to change for transitional housing services. Contract <coughs> value is $5,966,938 for over five years. Funding is through the Oregon Department of Corrections and Metro Supportive Housing Services measure funds. No county general funds are involved. Malcolm. Good morning, Chair and Commissioners. Malcolm McDonald, Captain, the Sheriff's Office over adult parole and probation. Uh, this agreement with Bridges to Change is a critical agreement. We've been a partner with them for over 20 years. We're serving individuals releasing from prison that have no safe place to go. Um, and they provide wraparound services, clean, sober housing, and can connect them with um, further treatment if they need it. Additionally, the housing and community, or SHS funding goes specifically for housing for two houses that support individuals that are on supervision that suffer from mental illness, significant persistently mentally ill, either in our community that needs stabilization or transitioning from prison that needs stabilization. Uh, Commissioner West. Yeah, I think this is like, we have a history with this organization. We know them well, it's been fantastic. Um, Captain McDonald, thank you for bringing it forward and totally supportive. Thank you. Yeah, no, they've been a critical part um, since they actually started in Clackamas County, and um, we went from a time of not having housing for individuals releasing from prison to developing this initial program when they started to having this critical resource. Yeah, and they have great outcomes too, and so it's been a good partnership. Thank you. You're welcome. So this is aid and assist? No, this is not aid and assist. This is specifically for um, adults releasing from prison. Um, onto post-prison supervision that um, returning to Clackamas County and that who we as uh, supervise on supervision. And how many will this contract serve? Um, we have each bed typically f filled continuously. Um, and for the number I don't have in front of me, the total number that we serve, I don't have that, I did not bring, I have the number of beds, but I didn't bring their um, yearly report that tells me the total number. I can get that to you and provide that to the board. Um, I, yeah, because it's almost six million dollars. Over four years. I yeah. understand no, that. No. I assume that the care is ongoing. It is. Individuals released from prison and have uh, 90 days of housing and then they are connected to permanent housing either within 90 days or sooner. Um, they receive uh, support in finding employment um, in addition to the connection to, to treatment. Um, so they have a choice of treatment? They, if their supervision requires it and they're found that they need treatment, uh, that is part of their supervision and they're, they're required to do that, yes. Uh, it is clean and sober housing. They ensure individuals are not using while in housing. They submit to UAs. They have mentors and, and wraparound services. Um, yeah, I can get the total number that is served to you. Um, yeah, I'm just curious. Yeah, yeah. I, sorry. Some Sorry. numbers I have off the top of my head, and that one I, I do not. That's fine. Yeah, just whenever possible. Any other questions? Seeing no objections. Item number two. Thank you. Approval of an intergovernmental agreement with the Clackamas County Fairgrounds and Event Center for Law Enforcement Patrols at the 2024 County Fair. Agreement value is $23,300 for one week. Funding is through the, the Clackamas County Fairgrounds and Event Center. No county general funds are involved. Nancy Artman. 
Thank you. Good morning, Chair, Commissioners. Ms. Bush, this is the annual operating plan for the county fair to provide patrol services, police services per the agreement for the duration of the fair. There is a schedule at the back of the agreement that demonstrates how many deputies will be there on which days, covering which shifts. With me today is Lieutenant Tony Killinger, who is the command officer over the fair operations, and we'd be happy to take any questions that you have. Questions about this? I, Commissioner Scholl? Lieutenant Killinger, how are you doing? Good, you? Yeah, I was down at the fair yesterday, talked to a lot of your people down there. They're doing a great job keeping the fair safe. I, have you been down there yet? I was, I was okay. all there yesterday, I missed you. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, but anyway, thanks for doing a good job at the fair. Thank you. Yeah, Killinger, we talked yesterday too. Thank you very much for our conversation. Uh, on that, and I talked to several others who are very happy to be at the fair. I would be. Good. Yeah, I love the fair. Um, thank you very much, uh, and hearing no objections. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, by the way, um, Malcolm, I have an answer to my question. The number is 39, so you don't have to give that to me. <laughs> and uh, our attorney just finished, furnished that information. Well, thank you, Council. I appreciate that. Yes, and, and that's, I would add, that turns over, so the total number we serve in, in a year. Right. Um, and it is critical to keeping the community safe that we pr totally. provide it. And so. Yeah, great program. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it. You bet. Chair, thank you. Thank you, Malcolm. Next up is Health, Housing, and Human Services. We have Rock Cook here, the director. Number one is approval of a grant agreement with the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development for continuum of care planning activities. Total grant value is $234,704 for one year. Funding through the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. The 25% match requirement is met through supportive housing services fund investments and no county general funds are involved. Uh, yes, this is a, a grant from the Housing Authority, uh, Federal Housing Authority, to offset the expenses incurred in the consolidated application process. Uh, the Housing and Community Develop Division will use the funds to support staff and expand capacity through existing contracts for technical assistance. Questions or comments? Seeing no objections. Okay. Item number two, approval of a revenue and intergovernmental agreement grant agreement with the Oregon Housing and Community Services Department for rapid rehousing programming related to the governor's state of emergency due to homelessness. Agreement value is $912,170.91 for three years. Funding is through the Oregon Housing and Community Services Department and no county general funds are involved. Now, this is a revenue agreement uh, funded by Senate Bill 5701 that, if approved, will provide funding for rapid rehousing programs that are intended to expand the initial investments made in House Bill 5019. Families that were served through the rapid rehousing program will be transitioning into a long, new long-term rental assistance program, our LTR, LTRA program. Uh, this funding will add new rapid rehousing placement capacity to our continuum of care. Questions or comments? Seeing no objections. All right. Item number three, approval of a grant agreement with the Oregon Department of Administrative Services for construction of the Clackamas County Stabilization Center. Total agreement value is $4 million. Funding is through the Oregon Department of Administrative Services. No county general funds are involved. I think this is one you're very familiar with and have supported, uh, but I'll go ahead and read it through. Um, H3S and the Sheriff's Office have partnered to establish a stabilization center in Milwaukee's former Women's Center building. Um, this grant agreement enables the county to receive the $4 million that the Oregon Legislature has allocated for this project. The stabilization center will offer short-term support, coping skills, and resources to adults in crisis through two programs. The north part will provide 24-7 behavioral health services, while the south half will provide housing stabilization for homelessness. Community-based organizations will be operating both of these programs. But Rod, do we have a, a final pro, uh, price tag on this project? We, I'm sure we do at this point, but I don't have it in front of me, but I could certainly get that. Um, we have a very anxious gentleman in the back that would like to come <laughs> forward and answer my question. Um, Thank you, Adam. 
Uh, good morning. Thank you, Chair. Um, Commissioners Adam Brown, Deputy Director, Health, Housing, and Human Services. Actually, this is out for bid right now. So um, the project team met yesterday. The bid was set to close at the end of this week, but we've gotten, um, I think there were 24 prospective bidders showed up at our pre-proposal on-site conference. There have been a number of questions that have come from those bidders. We're working to resolve those questions. We're actually going to extend the bid deadline for a couple of weeks because we think that will yield uh, better bids for us. So um, we're set to close now uh, towards the end of this month, but that will determine our final price for the project once those bids come in and we get that contract. I love that there are so many bidders. I mean, that's competition. And uh, of course, you know, I think all the board likes this project. I love this project. I think it's great. Thank you, legislators, for helping fund this. Commissioner Scholl. Yes, um, Adam Brown, on the north half, the 24-7 part, what is the 24-hour staffing requirement for that piece? Um, Commissioner, could you, uh, are, are you ask get, a question uh, more is specifically? Is it the 24-7 part on the north half of the project? Mm -hmm. That's going to require a 24/7 staffing on to be there 24 hours a day. Yeah, three that's, different shifts. That's right. So both sites will operate on a 24/7 basis, but you know the north half of the building is our stabilization center, right? So we expect our law enforcement partners, others, behavioral health crisis don't don't stop at midnight or or 2 a.m. Right. So there will be 24/7 operations. We expect the staffing model to maybe be lighter at night, yeah. but like you heard from Mary during our policy session update, there will be on-call access to things like psychiatrists or advanced mental health practitioners overnight. So, okay, so so there's gonna be an on-site 24-7, like nursing or uh, mental health uh, and security for that? Yes, absolutely. Okay. All right, thank you. Any further questions or comments? Seeing no objections, thank you. Thank you. Item number four, approval to apply to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development for the Eviction Protection Grant Program. Anticipated grant value is $2,500,000 for over two years. Funding is through the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, and no county general funds are involved. Uh, this program's objective is to assist Clackamas residents facing eviction in understanding their rights and receiving guidance and support through legal processes related to eviction. The grant increases staff capacity by 0.5 FTE. It would create a new program for homeless prevention that would connect to and fill in gaps for the number of existing programs related to homelessness prevention, eligibility for continued HUD funding, and other sources that will be explored. Questions or comments? Commissioner Shaw? Hey, Mr. Cook, on this one, uh, many of our property owners who own rental properties have had problems over the years collecting rents, problems with eviction. How will, will this help not only the families that are uh, subject to eviction, but how will it help our property owners stay whole in collecting those rents? So this is another piece to the puzzle. This part will actually tell renters that they have some, some opportunity to, to mitigate whatever they've gotten themselves into, i.e. Uh, eviction. And so this is going to help the, the renter part of it. The other part of our programs, we have programs in place now that we can sit alongside the landlord and talk about we have rent well where we actually guarantee if you let this particular renter in, we will guarantee that they won't, you know, smash walls or damage properties or not pay rent. We have other programs will actually help pay the back rent that's due to the landlord. So we're trying to put together a whole continuum okay. of services here so that everybody's happy at the end of the day. Landlord gets what they want, either paid or, or eventually eviction if that's what they really want, or if the renter is, if it's just about money and poverty, we're a actually able to help in both cases. So, so we think we're, okay. we're helping both sides of that equation. Okay, thank you. Questions or comments? See no objections. Item number five, approval to apply to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services for the Supporting Vaccine Confidence Grant Program. Anticipated grant value of $750,000 over three years. Funding is through the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and no county general funds are involved. 
Yes, this is a three-year grant to build on our efforts to increase vaccine confidence for preventable diseases like measles, leading to long-term health complications and costly hospital stays among the Eastern European communities of Clackamas County. The grant will facilitate the, Clack the County Public Health Division's current partnerships with community-based organizations that serve Eastern European communities thereby enabling them to strengthen their relationships and establish trust in local institutions and health care services. Questions or comments? Seeing no objections. All right. Thank you, Rod. Next is transportation and development. Item number one, approval of a resolution approving the five-year transportation capital improvement program for fiscal years 23-24 through 27-28. Total value is $219,500. $219,567,609 for the five-year period. Funding is through the County Road Fund, Community Road Fund, state and federal grants, tax increment financing, and system development charges. No county general funds are involved. And again, we have Cheryl Bell and um, Sarah Ekman. Morning again, Chair and Commissioners. Um, so the five-year capital, um, Transportation Capital Improvement Program, or the five-year CIP, is the list of capital transportation projects that are scheduled to be underway in the next five years and that have secured funding, reflect past board policy decisions, are expected to cost more than $50,000. The five-year CIP is updated biannually to provide detailed information regarding current capital project priorities. And it was last updated and approved by the board in March of 2022. The documents contained in your packet include a list and a map of all projects. There are 86 projects in total, including both capital construction and paving work. Total project costs are just over um, $219 million. 23% of the project costs, or $51.5 million, will be paid by County Road Fund. And 77% of the project costs, $186 million, will be covered through the grants, tax increment financing, more community rent fund, state, federal, and other regional grants. So staff are respectfully recommending approval of this five-year CIP. Thank you. Questions, comments? I, no objections. Oh, I have Shul. one. I have one. <laughs> yeah. You uh, snuck in on yeah. that. <laughs> are the people of Clackamas County who are paying their uh, Clackamas portion of the vehicle registration fee aware of what that that fee, that money, is providing to them in the county, because part of that, part of this 219 million comes from that, correct? It, it, yeah, it, part of it is part community it. road fund. Yeah, right. I, I, I'll answer what I know very high level, and then I can get back to you on this. I know the community road fund is wide um, community engagement on the work that they do, including a um, committee that helps vet those projects. So there is consistency in using, or there is um, consensus in using those funds. But I can look into that. Okay. I'm well, sure. that, that, no, yeah, that answer is fine. The other question I have is, uh, of, you know, we have a lot of different areas of the county competing for funds, projects, road improvements. D does this five-year plan uh, provide a uh, kind of a even spread of uh, investment across the county from places like Government Camp, Welch's, down to Malala, Canby, Lake Oswego, every, and places in between? Once again, I can look into that a little bit further for you. But in in reviewing the packet, there is quite a broad extension. Okay. Five years yeah. is a pretty long time, so we're yeah, covering multiple different projects in this five-year plan. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Further questions or comments? Seeing no objections. All right. Item number two. Approval of an agreement between with the Johnson Creek Watershed Council on the Rug Road Badger Creek Culvert and Fish Passage Project. Total agreement value is $496,312. Funding is through the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration Grant and the County Road Funds. No county general funds are involved. Thank you, good morning. This agreement is between Clackamas County and the Johnson Creek Watershed Council for the construction of the Badger Creek, um, lost my place there, at Rug Road and the Culver Replacement Process Project. The existing culverts are in poor condition and at risk of failure, so we're proposing to replace um, the existing culverts with one single 10-foot diameter culvert that will uh, result in a more resilient transportation structure and meet uh, federal and state fish 
passage criteria. The combination of funding does cover uh, the cost of the project. So the Watershed Council did obtain a grant uh, for a good portion of it, and then we have county road funds. There's a cash match in there that's referenced in the second paragraph of the staff report, which would be up to 129,000. However, if there's a need because of the bids, ex the bids exceeding the estimate, we could go up to 174,000. Questions or comments? Seeing no objections. Item number three, approval of a resolution declaring the public necess necessity and the purpose for the acquisition of the right-of-way easements and fee property and authorization, good faith negotiations, and con condemnate condemnation uh, actions for the Rug Road Badger Creek Culvert and Fish Passage Project. Total, total project value is $681,227. Funding is through the National through NOAA <laughs> and uh, <laughs> county road funds. No county general funds are involved. Approval of a board ordering approving solid waste management fee increases. No, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I went into the next slide. <laughs> After NOAA, I got, I got distracted. Sorry. Yeah. Great. This one's related <laughs> to our last item. Uh, so we have the same two existing 42-inch diameter culverts under Rug Road conveying uh, Badger Creek, and we're proposing to replace them with one larger culvert that will be um, more fish, fish friendly. So we're partnering with the Johnson Creek Watershed Action uh, or Council with a plan that identifies this area as an area of importance. In order to construct these improvements, uh, we have a need for permanent and temporary easements and fee acquisitions will be required. The project is expected to impact two properties which are abutting the project alignment. So we need, um, what we're asking for today is board approval on a resolution that directs department staff to proceed with good faith negotiations for the acquisition of the needed property rights. And to do that, we would utilize authorized real estate appraisers and other experts to assist in that process. We do this process with all of our public uh, projects that we construct and um, your approval of that resolution allows us to advance it. Questions or comments? Seeing no objections. Item number four, approval of a board order approving solid waste management fee increases, no fiscal impact, no county general funds are involved. So this is, um, on, this is a continuation of the recent conversations we've had regarding the annual solid waste fee review. The board heard this review um, on the July 31st policy session and then during issues on August 6th where the board voted three to two to move forward with the fee recommendations. To enact the fee changes that were part of that annual review, staff are requesting approval of the attached board order. Questions or comments? Seeing no objections. Item number five, approval of a public improvement contract with KNL Industries, Inc. for the Fisheries Mill Road Paving Project. Total value is $866,053.40. Funding is through the county HB 2017 program funds. No county general funds are involved. This is a paving project for Fisher's Mill Road, which will resurface approximately two miles. It includes all the elements of paving, which are listed in the staff report. 4,400 tons of asphalt is involved. It's quite a bit. The project was advertised in accordance with ORS and LCBR, LCRB rules on June 18th. We opened bids July 2nd and received six, and KNL Industries, the bidder for this project, was the lowest responsive bidder. Six bids, I like that. Do you know exactly where on Mich Fisher's Mill Road this is? I was just down there the other day. It goes, let's see, resurfaces Strobridge Road between South Springwater Road and South Fisher's Mill, which is classified as a local roadway, South Harding between Springwater and Fisher's Mill, and South Fisher's Mill Road between Springwater Road and the Clear Creek Bridge, which are both minor arterials. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Is this project for a grind and a replacement of blacktop, or is it an overlay project? So my knowledge is um, focused on what's contained in this staff report here. Yeah, so yeah. Um, I'm seeing that we have uh, 5,100 square yards of cold plain pavement removal. Okay. Definitely not an expert on that. Um, 
pavement repairs of varying depths, replace guardrails, all oh, that stuff. Okay, good. Thank yeah, you. Thanks. Uh, seeing no further objections. Okay. All right. Item number six, approval of a public improvement contract with TFT Construction, Inc. for the Friar Park uh, roadway improvements project. Total value is uh, $416,242.60. Funding is through the Oregon Parks Recreation Department, County Opportunity Grant, and Metro 2919 Parks and Nature Bond funding. No county general funds are involved. Great. So more paving, this time at a park. <laughs> uh, Friar Park, or I believe it's Fair, Fair, I never quite said that right. It's pronounced Friar, but it's spelled differently. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's uh, two miles southeast of the city of Malala on the Malala River. If you haven't been there, highly recommend checking it out. It is part of your county park system. So we have overnight camping there, along with a variety of day use activities. This contract will repave our day use areas and parking areas, replace our curbing, improve ADA parking and access to amenities at the campground. It is fully funded uh, through outside sources, so Oregon State Parks and Recreation and our Metro bond money from 2019. This was also advertised in accordance with ORS and LCRB. On May 24th, we opened bids on June 20th and TFT was our lowest responsive bidder on this one as well. Great. Questions or comments? Seeing no objections. Item number seven, approval of personal services contract with GSI Water Solutions, Inc. for Oncon land use hydrogeological hydro consulting. Total value is $150,000 for five years. Funding is through per permitting revenue. No county general funds are involved. We're gonna stick with ton twisters today and we're gonna talk about our hydrogeological contract, um, zoning and development ordinance section. 1006 requires applicants for certain development in state designated sensitive water areas to submit a hydrogeologic re review report. And then these regulations further require that the report be peer reviewed by professional of the county's choosing. The current contract for these hydrogeological consulting services expires on, on September 30, 2024. So DGD staff worked with um, county procurement to issue a request for proposals for these consulting services. The RFP was advertised in accordance with ORS and LCRB rules on May 9, 24, and proposals were received on June 6, 24. The county received two proposals for this work. An evaluation committee um, evaluated and scored these proposals and groundwater solutions doing business as GSI um, received the highest score. So we're requesting to contract with them for these services. Questions or comments? See no objections. All right, thank you. So next up, we have the Clackamas County audit presentation and we'll have Elizabeth Comfort, who is the director of our finance department, come up and kick off this presentation. Tony, Tony. Welcome. Thank Please you. introduce yourself. Yes. Good morning, Chair and Commissioners. Elizabeth Comfort, Finance Director with the County, and I have with me uh, Ashley. Ashley Austin with Moss Adams. She's a partner with our independent audit firm. Yes, Moss Adams. Thank you for coming today. Yes. Go ahead. Thank you. So today I'm going to ask Ashley to go through um, a final wrap of our fiscal year 22-23 audit. And then following that, we will kick off our fiscal year 23-24 audit plan. So, Thank you. Thank you, Chair Smith and commissioners. Uh, we'll go through a quick presentation and then entertain any questions you might have. Go ahead to the next slide, please. Or can I, do I do it or you do it? Thank you very okay. much. Thank you. Okay, I'll go over our service team members. And then we structured the presentation a little bit differently this year to go through a few questions that I think you would want to know answers to as county commissioners about the audit process. And then a quick rundown of what we talked to the audit committee about high level in terms of our required communications with those charged with governance. So your dedicated team, key service team members, I served as your signing partner. I um, was responsible for supervising the audit engagement. Amanda McClary-Moore is a partner in our Medford location and she's responsible for picking up a few things in our file, looking at our materiality calculation, looking at the financial statements. She doesn't have any relationship to anyone at the county, so she can challenge uh, decisions that I make in our file. And then Kevin Muller-Liley is a senior manager. He uh, helped with a 
lot of delegated engagement review. So the first question is, what does an audit of the county entail? So the first is an independent ver verification of your transactions and balances. Of course, we do set a materiality, so we don't audit every single dollar or every single transaction, but we're looking at those source documents. We're verifying balances with third parties through confirmations. We're doing an analytical review and asking questions if things don't meet our independent expectations that we're setting, and then we're performing substantive testing procedures, which is looking at invoices, looking at paper documents. We also evaluate the effectiveness of internal controls. So we review those key controls in all those significant transaction cycles. So things like payroll, revenue, disbursements, property taxes. We test in certain instances those for operational effectiveness and rely on those internal controls. And then we report any control weaknesses that we identify. The third item is we test compliance with federal and state laws. So that's related to your Oregon, Oregon minimum audit standards, which really relates to your budget adoption process, making sure you're going through all the required steps, as well as procurement. We look at a lot of your procurement process as well during, that, during those procedures. And then the federal grants compliance testing is related to your single audit procedures. So those federal funds that you receive and spend, over $750,000. I think your schedule of expenditures of federal awards showed over 100 million this year. We test a lot of those direct and material compliance requirements for buckets of funding that we think are significant overall to the county. We also perform a technical review of the financial statements, so we're making sure that the balances and the transactions that we tested as part of our audit actually match what's in the financial statements. And then we also make sure that those financial statements are meeting all the bells and whistles, so GAAP, state, legal, GFOA, um, award requirements, et cetera. And then we also make sure that the supplementary information is presented accurately. And then we report the audit results. So we did have uh, contact with finance staff throughout the audit process, regular contact. We had an exit meeting with the audit committee earlier this week, and then we're, I'm here today to report to you. So question number two, are the financial statements accurate? So what do we do? Um, we, we perform our own risk assessment to identify where the significant risks are in the county. We test internal controls. We also perform substantive testing, as I mentioned, and we perform that technical review of the financial statements. And I'm pleased to, to tell you that the county received an unmodified opinion, meaning your financial statements are fairly presented in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. That's the cleanest level, highest level of assurance that you can receive in what you want to hear. Question number three, did the county comply with the applicable federal and state laws and regulations? Again, we do perform our risk assessment procedures and we perform compliance testing over those federal grants and state laws. Uh, so in our report over Oregon Municipal, Oregon Minimum Standards, we did have one significant deficiency that we referred to, which was over financial reporting related to the Housing Authority of Clackamas County. Uh, that was related to, they implemented a new system, they had a few individuals that left. It was the lion's majority share of why the financial statements were delayed. Um, so th that resulted in a significant deficiency. Reconciliations were not prepared timely uh, due to a lot of various issues, system implementation, vacancies of staff. So recommendation there is to get that get the Housing Authority of Clackamas County in more regular contact with finance staff here, have more oversight, and be sure that the reconciliations are prepared timely. We also noted in our report there that there was one compliance finding related to the county's overexpenditure of funds in the county school fund. We are required to call that out. Management is also required to disclose it in the financial statements, which it was disclosed in note one. We tested five major programs for the single audit this year, and we, all, we identified one significant deficiency related to the health center program cluster. Management is required to file reports annually. It's called an FFR report. Those reports are required to be filed by a certain time, and a, I think three of the five reports we tested were not filed timely. So recommendation there to get those reports filed timely, and if you do file it and you don't, document um, when you filed it. We can't tell when the report was filed. So documentation really also needs to be um, added to make sure that you document when those reports are being filed. 
Okay, question number four, did the audit identify any fraud, waste, or abuse? Of course, again, Moss Adams, we evaluate the key controls. We also perform a brainstorming session with our engagement team independent of management uh, to determine any fraud risk areas. We also use our um, experience on other counties and, and cities and governments. And then we interv interview individuals throughout the county, not just finance staff, but individuals outside of the accounting department as well. And our testing uncovered no reportable matters of fraud, waste, or abuse during the audit. Quick high-level overview of the communication with those charged with governance. So we did have an in-depth discussion with the audit committee earlier this week. A uh, few things that you think that I thought you would want to know. Were there any audit adjustments? There were no corrected audit adjustments. So just as a reminder, management provides a trial balance. If we identify an adjustment that is material, that will impact the opinion that is rendered on the financial statements, that's a corrected audit adjustment. We would be required to tell you about those. There are also uncorrected audit adjustments. We did identify one of those related to uh, the valuation of investments. They needed to record um, the unrealized loss on those investments at the end of the year and didn't. Had that been corrected, investments and unrealized earnings would decrease in the governmental activities by 9.2 million. I know you see that 9.2 million and think that must be material, but you think about the county overall. It was material enough to share that information with you today, but not material enough for us to require that they post it. There were no difficulties encountered in performing the audit. We had no trouble getting access to individuals throughout the county. We had no, uh, no problems getting access to information and there were no disagreements with management about an accounting or auditing matter that we uh, needed to share here today. Uh, here's our contact information. I'm referring to Kevin. He's, he's you know, side by side with me throughout the audit process. So if you have questions, feel free to reach out to me or to Kevin. And then just a, a quick acknowledgement of finance staff, uh, the audit committee, the, the commissioners, thank you. Again, we are pleased to work with Clackamas County and any questions? I have a couple of questions. Uh, I sat on the audit committee this week and am aware of these findings, but I have a question regarding the housing authority of Clackamas County. There was two reasons why that um, was delayed. And you said you have identified those reasons and are correcting them. When will that process be complete with the housing authority? So maybe I can help with that. Uh, Elizabeth come for finance director. So we are partnering. Finance Clackamas is partnering with the uh, Housing Authority <coughs> Finance team and the HRS team. And so we have a uh, frequent meeting set up to make sure that the Housing Authority Finance team is um, current in meeting their milestones, their bank reconciliations, their preparations for the audit. So it's, uh, it's reliance on us and uh, the finance team when there. When will it be done? Uh, we have it uh, scheduled for no, uh, let's see. November 22nd, the hack audit to be completed. Good. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then we can file the completed audit. Is that right? After that? So we have several. We have nine component units uh, for Clackamas County, and so they are being done in order. We have two uh, trial balances already submitted this week, two more to be submitted. Uh, and then we will have, and we'll, that's the second part that we wanted to share with you today is that the audit for 23-24 for Clackamas County, which is the final, will be completed February 28th. Is that uh, on time? Uh, the due date is December 31st. Of and 24. Will, of 24. We will be requesting an extension of GFOA and of the state. And how many extensions have we had? In 24, none. No, in 23 years prior, years prior uh, the county has not filed by December 31st in the last six years. So that's problematic. I feel that we are not filing our audit reports on time. Uh, is there something uh, that you need that the finance department needs <clears throat> in order for this work to be done timely? Uh, I would be interested in hearing about that. You don't have to say today, but it is a concern of mine ever since I became chair that these audit reports be filed in a timely manner. Do we need another person? Do we need an outside help to come in? I think this is an issue that really does need to be addressed uh, on a policy level. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll bring it up with um, our county administrator. Secondly, on the school fund overpayment, just an over an expenditure. What does so that mean? Over, they were over budget 
by more than a dollar. And if you're over budget by more than a dollar, you are required to disclose that in the notes to the so financial statements. Was over, so is there any other exchange of money going back then? So I can help with that. Um, so we receive, actually the Treasury Department uh, receives notice from the state of how much and when to disperse the school dollars to the local schools. And so that uh, request came into Treasury in May of 23, and um, those dollars were above what was budgeted. The dollars we had in the accounting, but it was over what the budget amount was. Uh, the information was not reported to finance until August, so it was too late to do a supplemental budget to increase budget authority. But the dollars were available. It was just above the budget authority. Okay, thank you. I, Commissioner Scholl, were you next? I, I don't remember, sorry. I think so. Hey, good morning, thank you for your report. Um, on question three, um, question four, uh, did the audit identify any fraud, waste, or abuse? Your result was no. On um, question three, regarding the application of federal and state laws and regulations, you mentioned that uh, we had about $100 million uh, in grants that you, that you looked at. Uh, my question is, what visibility did the audit have on the administration of those grants when that money gets down to nonprofits? Because most of this money is being administered ultimately by nonprofits. So what kind of visibility do you have to ensure that when the money leaves here and goes to one of dozens of nonprofits that it is in fact being uh, utilized in accordance with federal and state law? We audited about 67 million of the 100 million. So we didn't audit every single dollar on that schedule of expenditures of federal awards. And those, that 67 million was broken up into five different buckets of funding. So you heard me say the health center program cluster. I think we also audited the uh, coronavirus relief uh, slurf fund. And I can't remember the other three off the top of my head. I apologize. I can follow back up with That's you okay. if you'd like. Yeah. Um, each of those different buckets of funding are governed by uniform guidance and the Office of Management and Budget Compliance Supplement. And if that bucket of funding is listed in the compliance supplement, then the feds, the agency that governs that funding, lists out the particular items that they want us to test. And in certain circumstances, subrecipient monitoring, which is where the county would be required to monitor the funds that are leaving the county to go to the nonprofit. Mm -hmm. So if the federal agency has deemed that significant for them, then we will test that. And, and the way that we test that is we look at management's risk assessment process to determine how they are risk assessing the subrecipients, whether they're gathering audits, uh, financial statements from the subrecipients to ensure that they are receiving an audit, seeing if they have any significant deficiencies or material weaknesses related to the funding that they receive from the county, but we don't actually audit the dollars that are being spent by the nonprofit. Their auditors would audit whether those funding, whether that funding was allowable or not. On the other side, we are also looking to see if those funds that the county is spending are allowable as well in accordance with the federal guidelines, requirements, et cetera. Okay, thank you for that. So <clears throat> an auditor for a nonprofit that's responsible for ensuring <coughs> th that nonprofit's utilization of federal state dollars well, it's not well, the auditor's responsibility. It is, it is, well, it's the nonprofits, but yeah. also the county in monitoring the spend of that fund. Okay, so the nonprofit, their, their auditors are communicating to finance, county finance on issues that might be a concern. But the reason I ask this question today is because as one of your, uh, one of the county commissioners, I'm always concerned about the appropriate utilization of $100 million broken down into many, 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 many uh, subcontracts. Uh, are those dollars being used, A, 
efficiently, B, in, a, in accordance with the federal and state law. In other words, when I go to bed at night, do I, do I need to worry about it? Mm -hmm. Well, I could go ahead. Do you I just wanted to add, we hired uh, Barry Dunn. They're a contractor for the county under finance, and they do our sub-recipient monitoring. So they do exactly what you're suggesting. They test, and they go in, and they look at the invoices. They verify that the spending is appropriate based on the dollars submitted under that um, uh, agreement. Okay, and that gentleman is contracted out by yourself, or is he on your staff? I uh, they're they're contracted as a company called Barry Dunn, B E E R Y Dunn, D U N N, and they do that for us, and they oh. report to us. Uh, we're in touch with them on a daily basis with our grants department. Okay, thank you very much, Commissioner Savas. Yeah, um, just to clarify, uh, the audit management of the audit process is done by staff, correct? Well, I'm over, I'm over the staff, so I am ultimately responsible for the audit process. True, but you report to staff, correct? Staff report to me, yes. Okay. Are you referring to county staff or county my staff? staff? County staff. Oh, oh no. I'm talking about Moss Adams staff. Oh, no, no, no county staff reports to me. That would render me non-independent, <laughs> so no. <laughs> they do not report to me. Right, so county staff manage the contract with Moss Adams, correct? So I, I manage I manage the staff or the contract with Moss Adams, and I, we have a team that prepares the financials and the reporting and the uh, work papers that are presented to the auditors. And the audit committee doesn't manage, essentially. I'm I'm being redundant here, but I'm trying to make a point. The the audit committee does not manage the contract. The Elizabeth and her staff manage the contract. So I'm a little bit puzzled, frankly, by the slide. Just lost it here. I'll pull it back up. That says those charged with governance, um, and then shortly after you mentioned that slide, you mentioned the audit committee. But you know, I'm a member of the governance, and so are all these folks here up at the dais. We're those. We are the governance of the county. Um, and in my prior roles, 20 plus years of doing an elected capacity, and longer than that in public budgeting. Um, prior roles was we were all contacted to see if there was anything that we felt was noticeable, had concerns of, and so forth. Um, and I've mentioned this before, but in recent years that has not happened um, in a one-on-one -on -one basis with Moss Adams like it did in the past. So I actually had that on my list to bring up today. So what I did last year, and I may have missed it the year before, is to reach out to each of you. And if you would like to meet with uh, our auditor, with Ashley, uh, let me know. And I will um, put the two of you in contact to make that scheduled appointment with your policy advisors. So that is absolutely available to each of you. And we did actually make that request this year. And no one wanted to meet with me. OK. Um, and how, how was that done? I, that was done through um, an email to to all of you, but I don't know was, how that was, was done. Okay. Was yeah. And I, I have complete confidence in Elizabeth Comfort as her role in the finance, so I don't want to, no reflection on that, but it just seems to me that that, in prior past, that the auditor, whoever it may have been in my prior roles, reached out to us directly. And that's what I'm saying is not happening here. So what does this slide mean? communication with those charged with governance. Can you just explain what that means? We deem the audit committee those charged with governance. Okay, uh, I'm not sure that has, actually has happened. I don't think that we have conveyed that or legally we can convey the authority to um, allow an audit committee to, to represent us um, and govern. I don't think legally we can even do that. I think I understand the role of the audit committee. I, I think that's a great asset. I'm not questioning that. But even things that are mentioned here today about whether or not the housing authority was an expenditure or was a um, uh, an over budgeted item clearly was de demonstrates that there is not full knowledge, and I didn't even know about it till I heard it. So um, all I can say is that I appreciate the work of the audit committee, but I don't think in and of itself it's representative of, of the governing body. I think that governance in under our professional standards is different than governance, that the definition that you think of when you think of governance. Our definition of governance is who 
uh, listens to our plan, who listens to the results of the audit. The audit committee, you ultimately, as the county board, accepts the audit. But we have some required communications that we are required to communicate to the audit committee or those charged with governance, which is much more significant and much more detailed than the county commissioners would want to sit through. Okay, so in those individual, in that outreach that you mentioned earlier that I was inquiring about that you went through our staff to get to us, that, that's a different, that's a different, governance is defined differently in that, in that outreach, right? You didn't reach out to the audit committee. You, you, no. you, you, you tried, attempted to reach out to each of us individually. Correct. Okay. Um, so the, earlier in the year, we received an audit regarding the sheriff's office and so forth. So how was that factored into your audit? That is uh, considered as part of our risk assessment procedures to determine if we need to spend additional time in other places throughout the county. Um, it, we have our own plan, our own procedures that we perform, and we take those into account during our risk assessment process. Can you give us a thumbnail sketch of your assessment of that audit? Are you referring to the work that Moss Adams performed? Uh, who did the audit for CCS? Moss Adams. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So would that not be... Would that not be a component of the annual audit? No, that was completely out of scope of the external oh, I, oh, audit. I understand it was, but would it, would it not be a component of the annual audit? Um, I'm not sure if we really want to get into the details here today, but my understanding from reading the report is that was a lot of um, relationships between the county and the sheriff's office and determining how the budget was determined, and we are responsible as your external auditor to identify if you're over budget and if you're in compliance with that, not necessarily determining the relationships between individuals throughout the county. Yeah, I, I thought it touched on controls, um, did it not? It touched on, so it was a different team within Moss Adams. Sure. Yeah, and so it did touch on use of chart of accounts, uh, timing, and so a lot of that stuff has to do with, uh, it impacts the finance, central finance when we were putting together the work papers and trying to close the fiscal year. So by the time we have the work papers and our financials prepared, a lot of that is not really, I think, you know, brought to the surface when our financial auditors are present. It's more of the preparation, closing the year, th uh, activity throughout the year, or were the uh, performance audit reviews. Does that make sense? So it was a different aspect. Yeah, I, I, I understand that the annual audit is not a performance audit, and the other one was somewhat of a performance audit. So I, I get that, but it just seems to be, it would be a component of the whole entire thing and that um, in future coming years going forward, that follow-up of those aspects that were mm -hmm. control and so forth, chart of accounts, et cetera, would be factored or reviewed and monitored, make sure that they're being fulfilled or the recommendations are being fulfilled. Those recommendations were not identified as part of the external audit, though. So we would follow up on items that are identified as part of the external audit. Like I mentioned, we did consider that report as part of our risk assessment procedures in determining what to what to test, what to focus on, but we are not responsible to go back to the performance audit and identify what's been fixed and what's been corrected. That's not our responsibility as your external auditor. Okay. Um, we are, uh, the county is following up on the performance audit and work, the finance team is working with um, the sheriff's office. So we have made progress and, and I believe Gary, our county administrator, will have an update for you as well. You're all, far more educated, knowledgeable professionals in the field of audits and budgets, far more than I am. So I'm just a lay person here um, who's been in elected roles and ran a business for, you know, most of my life. So I have a different, come from a different place. It just seems to me that the exposure um, and um, that the audit identified um, should be something that somewhere along our auditing process is is reviewed to make sure that we are um, uh, not having any any risk or exposure to any risk and progress so that's that's my rationale for mentioning it and I, I somehow making sure that we get a, a direct contact from our auditor 
uh, each, all five of us on this board. Um, That'd be great. Yeah, because because I you know again I, I have no I have 100% confidence in uh, Elizabeth Comfort as the finance director, but again the contract is managed by the staff. Your contract is managed by our staff, so therefore there needs to be some avenue to make sure that you know there's not a um, that we're not isolated. Mm -hmm. Well, you have my contact information on the back of this slide, and you're. Please feel free to reach out to me, but I will be sure to reach out to you. Okay, thank you. Um, a point of clarification: um, the audit committee is established because why? Is it statutory? Is it? No, many many years ago, um, under our professional standards, it it wasn't established due to due to us, but it was it was generated because there was this ideal in the SEC world where you needed to res you needed to have a committee that was responsible for oversight of the auditors so the audit committee was established um, in many public companies and that really rolled downhill to a lot of nonprofits a lot of governments etc some governments don't have audit committees it it's very dependent on your own rules and re your regulations, your charters, et cetera. So you, the county has chosen to have an audit committee and that is under our professional standards who we communicate all of the detail, um, which you were, you were in that meeting, Chair Smith, it wasn't something that yeah. would need what to. I'm getting, that's longer than I I'm, wanted I apologize. To. Okay, so the makeup of the audit committee is what? Uh, we have the chair and the uh, vice chair from this commission board on there, we have two department directors that sit on that, on appointed department directors. Uh, we have two citizen uh, members, says, uh, representatives from the community sit on that. Um, and then we have one liaison from our budget committee. So that is the makeup. Thank you, and I will say those um, citizen volunteers are quite knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. They are very well educated and our professionals in the area. Yes. So this is just an information only presentation. Thank you for coming forward and presenting this today. Nancy, we have quite a bit left to do today. I'm gonna to take a break for five minutes. We'll come back and finish five minutes, commissioners, and we have quite a few things that need to be accomplished today. That is correct. Thank, Thank you, you very you much. Very much. We are back from recess and we'll reconvene. Deputy County Administrator Nancy Bush, you're up. Yes, thank you. So one of the things I did forget to mention before is that all the consent agenda items will appear on your agenda tomorrow and I wanna make sure that there's no objections there. All right, thank you. Next up we have the Metro Urban Growth Report, draft letter of comment. And Cheryl Bell is gonna be presenting today for that. And the, you do have that item in your packet. You have the letter in your packet. So, uh, good morning again. Um, Metro reviews the urban growth boundary, or UGB, approximately every six years, and we're in that review cycle currently right now. Um, as part of this work, Metro developed an urban growth report, and this report is now open for public comment. Staff have been reviewing this report and are recommending we send a letter, a comment letter to express some concerns about our needs for the Clackamas County. I'm gonna have Jennifer Hughes with me, our planning director, to kind of walk you through the letter and share more about um, what, we're, what we are recommending in this letter to send back on public comment. Good morning, I'm Jennifer Hughes, and as Cheryl said, I'm the planning director. Um, I think kind of a couple key points about this letter, I'm not gonna walk through it point by point unless you ask me to, but I'm happy to answer questions. But there's kind of two key messages here. Um, the first thing is that when they do this urban growth report, it's not that it's not that it comes out with one magic number that says, you know, the region's gonna grow by this many people or this many jobs. There's a range that they can assume. And so Metro Council will ultimately make a decision about where they think we're gonna land within that range. And that has a direct impact then on how much land is or isn't added to the urban growth boundary. So the first point in this letter is that uh, staff is suggesting that you support the high growth rate. 
um, essentially because for a couple of reasons. One, as we know, the region is short on housing, and we know that there are new expectations that are coming from the state regarding housing production for local jurisdictions. And we also know that we're looking to create um, opportunities for good jobs. And so we feel like choosing the high growth rate gives local jurisdictions the most flexibility and the Metro Council the most flexibility to increase um, land in the urban growth boundary. And then the second thing um, is related to the way that Metro analyzes buildable land for, for jobs in terms of how they consider whether we have an appropriate amount of industrial land. Um, although they've found, I think it's like 6,000 acres of available industrial land, the, the statistics on how big those sites are are pretty eye-opening. You know, the average site size is like 3.8 acres or something like that. Um, so we're suggesting that you comment to Metro saying we really need to be looking or we need you to be looking at industrial land needs differently, to be considering the characteristics of the sites that we have available and the characteristics that we actually need in that land supply. Now they have done that kind of analysis for the Sher City of Sherwood's expansion request, um, but it's not necessarily kind of their, their go-to when they're analyzing industrial land. So those are the two key points. Um, and on that first one about the assumptions on the growth rate, uh, this is also tied to our um, our position with Metro that they should not do another UGB swap. You'll all remember that when Tigard uh, wanted to add acreage to the urban growth boundary, that happened as a swap and we lost land in our UGB. This time the request is from Sherwood and there's no indication at this point that they are planning a swap, but point being that is a tool in Metro's toolbox and so this letter would indicate that that is not the route that we would like them to go. So the. With that, um, oh, and finally, this isn't your last chance to, to comment. This is just step one, the urban growth report. Yes, and there will be hearings and other options as this process continues through the year. Us to let Metro know what we think. Correct. Generally. I believe, yes. Commissioner West, you were up. I think it's important to be accurate, and Chair, maybe you agree with me, maybe this board does, is that we didn't do a swap, we had a taking. <laughs> and takings and swaps are different because we didn't get anything in return. So That's it, right. I mean, we lost. So we had a subtraction of opportunity <laughs> and somebody else got an addition. I'm still waiting for our addition to make this a swap. Has anyone seen an addition to our resources? Anybody? I'm waiting. Bueller? <laughs> Bueller? Anyone? Oh no, there was a taking from Clackamas County if I remember correctly. Um, and I th maybe our letter should also articulate that we are still waiting to be made whole and um, that uh, that we would also like to have land brought back into our UGB that allows us to develop appropriately um, and uh, make that continue to make that clear and advocate for what's important for Clackamas. Thank you. Um, before I go to the other commissioners, you say appropriately, you know, they've listed, as Commissioner Scholl pointed out, uh, an industrial parcel size of 1.7 acres. Whenever I hear somebody wanting to come to Clackamas County, they're always looking for large lot industrial, large lot, 20 acres. 10 acres is an absolute bare minimum, I would think, on a lot of these. But developing, or this, how should I say this? Metro is restricting our size of uh, large industrial lots, and that would really have an impact on our growth our economic growth, our ability to cite jobs and businesses in Clackamas County. And I do think that is way too small, but I'll let other commissioners opine. Commissioner Shull, go. Yes, thank you. Good morning. Okay, so on the on your letter, I like it, uh, but the Metro's industrial land analysis is extremely flawed, in my opinion. Last year, I attended the meeting of the Columbia River Corridor industrial developers um, in Multnomah County, we met. And I, I learned that one of the last remaining 20-acre parcels in that, court, that Columbia River corridor development zone from the Port of Portland on the Willamette to Troutdale was a remaining 20-acre parcel that re would require to develop 740,000 cubic yards of fill. That's, that's how pressed Multnomah County is for attracting businesses that need at least 20 acres of commercial property. 
So in that meeting, uh, it was maybe 60 developers and builders. They said, well, we're looking now to Clackamas County to find larger commercial plots to build on. But, we, but there are none, or very few. And so the report here that says that the uh, average industrial parcel in the 6,000 acres is 3.8 acres with a medium industrial parcel of 1.7 acres is almost laughable. It's almost laughable because, um, you know, in addition to some of our taxation problems we have in the state, making it difficult for counties to attract business to come here, we have this other problem with virtually no area, no, no uh, plots of land, parcels of land that are big enough to attract the kind of business we really need. So in your, in your letter, again, I think it's good, but the paragraph uh, regarding uh, the, the, uh, the industrial land issue here that you ha have top of the uh, top of the second page, mm -hmm. I believe that we need to have a, have a sentence in there that says, you know, Clackamas County needs in your metro industrial land analysis a focus on opening up land in Clackamas County that will have uh, provisions for 20-acre, 50-acre, 100-acre parcels so we can actually have a situation where we can attract new business, attract new jobs, and attract new, uh, new uh, economical uh, stimulus to our county. And I, I don't care if Metro says that the Metro region has got 6,000 acres. I really don't care. What I really care about is what do the reports say they're going to do for Clackamas County to improve our county's future? Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Samus. Yeah, um, I, there's parts of this I think are kind of vague. Um, but with respect to uh, what Commissioner Scholl just said, I do recognize that Metro Council doesn't look at individual cities to make up, have the, or the counties to have the greater regional needs. They look at it from a regional lens, not from an individual jurisdictional lens. Um, and if we, if we had acreage and it was used up, then we wouldn't have acreage, right? So. But the question really is, I think what's missing here, I mean, I, I know we have other opportunities to comment, but is a, is a greater economic analysis that demonstrates why, um, you know, if we're, with all the emphasis on housing, uh, which is people, uh, that we're growing, that we're growing that, the same token, there needs to be some proportional, at least some math that demonstrates that um, those people need to have jobs and, you know, certainly gonna be commercial, some will be industrial, but that there's, there's a uh, demand and market for it. So if this region is going to be economically successful, um, then I, I think that we would have to grow our business side, the job side, in order to make sure that people that are being housed here, moving here, that there's adequate jobs, you know, the market's there. So that part, and I don't know if that's a greater than an economic analysis, um, then great. You know, I, I've been around in my capacities um, uh, for years watching these urban growth boundaries, and it seems like um, the rules change, and sometimes the interpretation of the rules change when the rules don't change, um, and then the interpretations change, um, or and but the reasoning changes. Uh, it's. It, there's, it doesn't really seem to be, there's not a lot of consistency in how things come about and how and where. Um, so I, this is, um, this has been going on for a long time. Back in the 90s, I remember I, the first study I, I saw was back in the 90s when there was a regional industrial land, um, jobs land shortage. So 
it hasn't really changed a lot, and a lot of these boundary expansions haven't been to accommodate industrial as much as it has been housing. So it seems to be housing focused. And so, uh, you know, my, you know, if this is one of many letters, that's fine. Um, but I think there needs to be some economic analysis that is done by a private party, contracted by a private party um, that is independent and not managed by you know, any particular governor, so it doesn't have any bias. Uh, I'm just concerned that we're, maybe we're saying the right things, but I think we need to be calling out the whys um, uh, more so than the, the, the issues. Um, I'll leave it there. I agree with an economic analysis, um, Commissioner Savas, on that. And I do believe our Office of Economic Development and our manager is working on that, correct? Uh, yes, there's a report. I think it's called the Economic Landscape Analysis. That's sort of the first piece. I think first there'll be piece, steps I, that may come after that. I think there's many more cover coming, but for the purposes of this letter, we do need to respond to the Metro's report and, and say something, and that's just for today. <clears throat> Commissioner West? I, I think we have a bigger issue here that maybe should also be stated in the letter is this has direct impact on the economy, the growth of the region and the metro area, jobs so people can afford homes and so we can have a good, stable um, civil society. And we have some pretty alarming news coming out of the Portland area, and it's not good, um, colleagues. Pat Doris with um, Channel 8 just came out with this report. This, this data actually comes from an Oregon State economist. Um, right now, Oregon, according to the data, in the greater Portland area of which we are a part of here in Clackamas County, um, the greater Portland area lost jobs from April 2023 to April 2024. Oh, it gets worse. And had the largest unemployment loss of all top 50 states in the U.S. metro areas. I think Nike is laying off, no, Wells Fargo is laying off. We are seeing harbinger of, of some, some really hard times potentially economically on top of the cost to do business, the inflationary cost. Many of these businesses have reported to go to other states that have different climates that allow them to build and to develop and to expand and to grow as a business. Here in the metro area, we've made it very difficult for that expansion to happen and for that growth to happen. Um, and we've and there seems to be kind of a death grip on the land that doesn't allow us to actually grow as a community and also promote businesses who often pay for all the programs that we want to have done as government. Um, I'm, I'm very concerned that if we really want to get serious about recovering an economy, that these buildable lands that um, we need, uh, that we are all lacking in, um, need to be um, prioritized. And we've been asking for this for a long time in Clackamas County. We've been very aware of this. I think now we're starting to see the evidence um, in the economic numbers coming out right now. And I think that we should uh, maybe speak to that a little bit in our letter, how what, what, this, what, what is the economic impact? What is it, how it's, disadvantaged, it's making us disadvantaged here in Clackamas County compared to other regions and we're losing a pet of us. Actually, we're last out of metro areas right now. Um, uh, we're winning at lo job loss. That's what we're winning at. We're not winning at job growth or business development or innovation or creation of industry here in the metro area. We, by the numbers, clearly have a lot of work to do. And these bad public policies contribute to these alarming numbers. And I think we should speak to that some in our letter. Um, also, uh, Metro cites 6,000 acres available to Clackamas County. It's not available to us to build. That is a lie. When this uh, urban growth boundary situation was established, they took a whole swath of Damascus and put it in there so they could pump up their numbers. Most of that area will never be developed. It's farms or it's nurseries and it's steep ground. Most industrial land needs to be fairly flat, doesn't have to be perfectly flat, but the more slope it has to it, the more development cost 
for the owner and therefore their unwillingness to maybe tend to look at some of this. We've had some out on the Clackamas River, out on the industrial way. The lands were not flat and took a very long time and a lot of money to develop those. So the, also the, the 6,000 acres will never be developed. Now, is there a time element to this letter to go out? Okay. Yes, I think you have to approve it before your recess if you okay. want to make the deadline. But as I said, you will have other we, opportunities. You know, we'll have other opportunities, commissioners. Commissioners, is there anything that's giving you heartburn <clears throat> that is not in this letter that you would like to see? That's a good question. Well, because uh, uh, knowing that we're going to have another um, opportunity. Yes. The the only thing that, like I said before, the only thing about the letter that I think needs more emphasis is some comment about the need for larger size parcels in Clackamas County. Mm -hmm. And again, I, I have compassion for Washington County and Multnomah County, but my concern is this county. And we need larger parcels. We need that UGB opened. Okay, so we could add um, s some language to that. Yes. Is that understandable to you? Yes. Okay, um, Commissioner Savas. Well, I, I just wish we actually had a works. I mean, this, this is something that is, you know, frankly requires a, a, a lot of thought and discussion. So, you know, just going back to the 13,000 acres that was brought in in the uh, that particular time, and you know, prior to that was the some of the studies that I just mentioned earlier um, with regard to, you know, being done in the 90s saying that we've got this shortage of industrial lands and so on and so forth. But I, I, um, I <laughs> don't like to hear that lands out in Damascus will never be developed. I mean, never is a very powerful word. Um, and uh, I would say that the obligation for Metro to when they brought that land in to help us with the infrastructure. I don't necessarily mean financially, but certainly I don't mean in a, the, in a way that where they block transportation projects, not help us get those, whether that is state or federal funding, that they could have been a partner in providing, helping us with some of that infrastructure. And some of those businesses that are leaving that Commissioner West talked about, you know, um, uh, it, uh, transportation is one of those factors when they weigh in whether or not what and where they'll invest in across the country they have choices there's other states to go where the transportation system works better um, and uh, yet we are again don't have um, those investments being made here in our county um, as much as they are made elsewhere um, but I, I just think there needs to be a lot more meat on the bone so my question is what's the distinction Jennifer with the deadline that this letter is going to be submitted versus the other opportunities. What, how, how, how influential can other opportunities be? So this is the comment period on the draft urban growth report that's come out. The next thing that happens is that Metro's chief operating officer will issue their recommendation, and that's slated, I think, for the 26th. I'm going to look at Martha. 26th of August 26th that the that the COO recommendation will come out and then there's hearings that the Metro Council will actually have the decision they don't make until December so you know I would say this is maybe early in the process and you certainly will have an well, opportunity have to a write a stronger one. letter if you would like okay. and I've okay. taken lots of notes so about if we do this and sure, Mr. I was, I point we could submit a stronger letter later correct, correct. okay go ahead Go ahead, Commissioner Savas. Are you done? Commissioner Savas, go ahead. So my concern is that once the CEO recommendation comes out, it's like cement, right? Mm -hmm. Stone, it's hard to change it. Mm -hmm. um, so therefore, when did the, when, when did, how much time have we had to actually put together a letter I think it started as a 30-day comment period. They may have extended it by a couple of weeks. And Martha may have the exact date. I don't have it in front of me. You know, that might be something we asked ask to be included is, is extending the period of time to comment before the CEO recommendation again because of the habits in which um, seem to play out that once it's, once it's made, um, they've already, you know, 
whoever they are, whether it's Metro or other United government, whenever a recommendation comes out, it's very hard to change it. That's an uphill battle. Further comment, Commissioner Savas? I yield back. Sure. Yeah, okay. I couldn't help but comment regarding the transportation uh, issue and how it affects our future and um, land. And I just want to say that our single best opportunity to see growth, land rezoned for commercial and residential for the next 50 years is the Sunrise Corridor all the way to Highway 26. That there, that transportation infrastructure would open up the potential for the kind of lands we need that we're talking about here that were short. Mm -hmm. So just keep that in mind. It's not for today, but don't forget that. Commissioner West. Uh, Chair, I'm prepared that to, to make a motion if um, we are ready to do that. I can make a stab at it and do Go my ahead. best. Go ahead and make a stab. Um, I move that we um, recommend that the board approves this comment letter with a couple adjustments. Mm -hmm. Um, to add language that would include larger industrial lots between 20 to 50 to 100 acres, that we would recommend that in the future or moving forward that Metro extend the period of time for comments to at least 90 days, um, and uh, that we will look at future communications to strengthen our argument moving forward on the impacts of this policy. Uh, the last one, I wasn't clear on future. Com communications, another, you know, basically we talked about another bite at the apple, so yeah. future communications right. to comment on this okay. policy. Oh, we look forward to future communications. Communications or okay. letters on this policy as it has far reaching implications in our county. How about substituting the word opportunities? I'm fine with that. Yeah. Um, substituting opportunities for communications. Is yeah. that what I heard? Yep. Okay. I'm, I'm perfectly fine. Yep. Okay. That's my Second. Motion. Okay. Is um, the motion clear to you, Tony? We approve the letter with three recommendations. It is, Madam Chair. Three addendums, I should say, additions. Okay. And it has been made by Commissioner West and seconded by Commissioner Savas. Further discussion? I have a question about yeah. my own process here. Is this a letter that's signed solely by you, Chair, or is this signed by the entire Board of well, County Commissioners? What are we all doing of us, here? All of us can sign it if you're willing. Yeah. yeah that's fine. Yeah. yeah. Signed by all of us. Signed by all of us, yeah. Thank you. Um, and then, uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Seeing no further discussion, Tony, would you please take the poll? Commissioner Schull? Aye. Commissioner Schrader? Aye. Commissioner Savas? Aye. Commissioner West. Aye. Chair Smith. Aye. Motion passes 5-0. Thank you very much, you. commissioners, and thank you, staff, for coming forward. Okay. Nancy, what's next? All right. Next, we have the Clackus Values and Outcomes for the 2025 State Legislative Transportation. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> next, we have, uh, yeah, the, the transportation package, which is Tonya Halowski. So, Tonya? Good afternoon, commissioners. Tonya Holowski, Public and Government Affairs. Um, Commissioners, as you remember, on July 30th, PGA presented the proposed values and outcomes document in preparation for the 2025 legislative session and the expected transportation package. You provided input, and uh, that input was submitted to the committee, the C4 committee, on August 1st. And uh, your input and other input was considered, and um, the attached uh, document is the letter, is the document that has been approved by C4. So today we are requesting that you consider adding the county logo to the joint values and outcomes document, and that uh, the, the letter uh, will be ready to use starting in September 2024. How many of our edits were received by the C4 committee? I think uh, most. Um, and yes. then other jurisdictions added comments exactly. to strengthen yes. it. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, Commissioner West, do you have a question? No. Okay. Yeah. Comment, commissioners. I read it. It looks good. 
Uh, do we need, do we need uh, a motion on this? Uh, I'll accept a motion. I, I move we accept the uh, version of the values um, document presented here today. Second. Commissioner Savas has moved we accept the transportation values document and Commissioner uh, Schrader has second the motion. Further discussion? Yeah, I just want to, uh, a lot of collaboration, a lot of agreement between the county and all the cities went into this. I think it was a unanimous vote, right? Um, Commissioner Savas and C4 on this. It was. A good dialogue, really good collaboration with all our different entities and authorities. So this is a really good move, I think, and, it, and I'll be voting yes. Thank you very much uh, for all the work done on this and C4 and all the participants. Tony, would you please take the poll? Commissioner West? Aye. Commissioner Schull? Aye. Commissioner Schrader? Aye. Commissioner Savas? Aye. Chair Smith? Aye. Motion passes 5 0. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioners. All right. Nancy, you. what's next? Next, we have designation of newspaper for 2024 property tax foreclosure publication, and Jane Vettel is going to do the presentation. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, for the record, I'm Jane Veto, and I am here today to request that the Lake Oswego review be designated as the paper of uh, general circulation for tax foreclosure properties. Just a little background, we were here, my office was here in July, and at that time the board designated um, a different paper that is now defunct in the past month and has gone out of business. Oh. And we need to get this um, foreclosure list up. So um, the next paper in line is the Lake Oswego Review. So we're requesting that designation pursuant to ORS 312040. There will be an additional cost. This is a little bit more money. It's about $600. But I mean, this paper is still in business, so that's a plus. Commissioner West? Um, does this paper have to have countywide circulation? It does not. The statute requires that it be a newspaper of general circulation by the county, and I believe that determination has been made by the tax and assessor. Was Hoodview um, View? Hoodview? Hoodview News. Hoodview News, thank you. They have a pretty big reach in a big chunk of the county. Okay. Um, they might have a bigger reach than Lake Oswego View. Um, I'm just curious how we did, what went into Anna, to kind of choosing um, the Lake Oswego review. I think that the Hoodview News is, would be significantly larger in its reach and it might be a, a good paper to look at to have more. Um, now, Pamplin had, had the county reach, but they don't have that anymore. I'm, it's my understanding that maybe somebody's bought out that paper, but we don't know what that's going to look like. But Hoodview News might be a really good asset. I think they're they're pretty large. Even they might cover at least most of all of the, the east side of the county. Okay. Um, for today's purposes, would it be all right if we proceed with Lake Oswego Review? I have notes to take a look at Hood Review, and next time this comes up, we take a look at that paper. Totally fine. There's a suggestion. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That's fine. All right. Thank you. So we can proceed. I, you could take a vote today, or this could go on the consent agenda for tomorrow. Okay. How about consent agenda for tomorrow? If there's no vote that's needed, Tony. Okay. Do that. Thank right. you, commissioners. Thank, thank you, county council. All right. Thank you, Jane. So next is the advisory boards and commissions, and Tony Mayer, Nick Clark to the board. Commissioners, there is one advisory board and commission recommendations. Planning commission staffed by Department of Transportation and Development currently has. Ah, okay. Three openings in the commission due to term expirations and two term openings due to partial terms due to resignations. I was trying to understand how there were three terms and five names. Um, there are five recommendations. Those are Thomas Peterson to a fifth term, Michael Wilson to a third term, Jennifer Satter to a first term, Ryan Founds to a first term, and Brian Lee to a first term. Commissioner Shaw, would you like to make a motion? Yes, I move to approve the uh, no, uh, nominations to the Planning Commission of Thomas Peterson, uh, Mitchell Wilson, Jennifer Statter, Ryan Founds, and Brian Lee. I'll second. Commissioner Schull has moved, or, um, we approve the recommended names to the Planning Commission. Commissioner West has second that motion. I'll say Commissioner Schull and I sat on the interviews with staff for an entire afternoon. 
and not only interviewed these people, but others as well. And I think we have a pretty good uh, group of people wanting to do this work. No doubt. Yeah, and they're quite knowledgeable. And in fact, one of them served on a planning commission for a city, and so that really went well. Any uh, further comments, Commissioner West? Yeah, I just, yeah, thank you for taking the time. That's a big undertaking. That's a lot of interviews. That's a lot of work. Um, but this is a, one of, I believe, in my opinion, is one of our more consequential advisory boards. Um, and so thank you for making sure and vetting that and making sure that we're going to get the good advice to help us make good policy. So, and thank you to everybody that applied and those that were chosen just to help serve their community. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tony, would you please take the poll? Commissioner Savas. Aye. Commissioner Schrader. Aye. Commissioner West. Aye. Commissioner Schull. Aye. Chair Smith. Aye. Motion passes 5-0. Thank you very much. Up next. All right. Thank you. So we are going to take a look at it, your agenda for tomorrow for approval. First, it's a very straightforward agenda. We, we have the consent agenda, public communication, administrator update, and then uh, communi uh, commissioner communication. Does that meet with your approval? All right. Thank you. All right. Um, next, before we do uh, commissioner's um, communication, we're going to have the National Hazard Mitigation Plan presentation. So I'm going to bring up Jamie Poole, who is Acting Director of Disaster Management, and she will also introduce her staff as well. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Smith and uh, Commissioners. Uh, Jamie Poole with Disaster Management. I'm here with Molly Cajano, our uh, disaster Management Resilience Planner. Uh, today we're here uh, to seek approval to move the Multi-Jurisdictional Natural Hazard Mitigation Plan to the consent agenda process. So moving it to consent. Um, you recently went through a similar process to approve the Community Wildfire Protection Plan. That plan focuses on wild wildfires specifically, whereas the Natural Hazard Mitigation Plan is broader and covers a variety of hazards. In addition, FEMA requires the Natural Hazard Mitigation Plan to be approved by resolution for their uh, recognition of the plan and compliance. FEMA plan recognition provides Clackamas County grant funding opportunities for hazard mitigation activities. And Molly has prepared a short presentation for you to go over the plan. Hand it over to Molly. Great, thanks. You're welcome, and go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioners and Chair Smith. Molly Kajano with uh, Disaster Management. So I have a brief presentation of the hazard mitigation plan. Is that the clicker there? Perfect. So I'll just advance to the next slide here. Uh, so the Multi-Jurisdictional Natural Hazard Mitigation Plan is a document that outlines our county's risk to natural disasters and identifies strategies to reduce our risk. So um, it includes risk to all hazards. As Jamie mentioned, the Wildfire Protection Plan focuses um, on reducing risk specifically to wildfires, while this plan includes um, all hazards, floods, earthquakes, ice, and heat events, um, as well as wildfires. So the graphic on the slide here helps us kind of visualize how we understand our risk. So on the left, it shows that we look at a profile um, of the most common natural hazards that the county experiences. And then we measure that against the vulnerability of our systems uh, to that hazard. And so that overlap in the middle is how we measure our risk to disaster. So from understanding that risk, um, we can identify projects and uh, targeted strategies that help um, reduce and mitigate our risk. Um, so the county has been doing this planning for many years. Um, the BCC adopted the first natural hazard mitigation plan in the country in 2002. <coughs> and Clackamas County's plan has served as a model for communities um, throughout the nation. Um, our plan is multi-jurisdictional. So that means that um, this planning process involved 15 cities and special districts across the county, um, in addition, of course, to our unincorporated areas. Um, our current plan was adopted in 2019. It expired in April. And um, to stay eligible for grant funding, FEMA requires that plans be revised and adopted every five years. Um, so this is perhaps the most important function of the hazard mitigation plan. Um, while the plan's not regulatory, um, having this plan makes the county eligible for federal funding for hazard mitigation assistance grants. Um, so in blue sky times, the plan allows for the county to apply for these mitigation assistance grants on behalf of individual homeowners and business owners. Um, 
And post-disaster, having the hazard mitigation plan in place makes us eligible for a percentage of those statewide uh, mitigation dollars that come in after a presidential declaration. So uh, just a, a quick recap of our planning process. Um, the planning process uh, for creating this plan was done over the last two years. We revised our risk and vulnerability assessments. Um, then we held community meetings with each um, participating jurisdiction in our plan and distributed a survey to the public to get feedback on our mitigation strategies. Um, we posted a draft plan online and um, had that open for public comment for about three months to get feedback. And then this last spring, we received approval from the Oregon Department of Emergency Management and received an approval pending adoption letter from FEMA on May 29th. Um, so now we're bringing that to you for final adoption. And just to note that all 15 cities in this plan have already adopted uh, their um, annexes at this point. Um, so for community and partner involvement, the Hazard Mitigation Advisory Committee, that's made up of those participating jurisdictions um, and utility partners, they're really the steering committee for this work and are really critical in reviewing and um, revising those mitigation strategies before we included them in the, in the plan. Um, the countywide survey I mentioned, that was open for five weeks. We, re we received 2,544 responses, um, and those were from uh, community members across the county, so experiencing different hazards. Um, we held multiple community meetings to support folks developing their annexes, and we also received public comments from the Emergency Preparedness Council, uh, Portland General Electric, Electric and the um, members of the public. So the, the primary objective of this update is to just make sure that we're using up-to-date hazard projections and that the county's uh, priorities and those community concerns for mitigation um, are in alignment. So um, the significant revisions to this plan include that risk assessment. Um, they include that updated um, community risk profiles for unincorporated areas. Um, our new mitigation actions and strategies include things like um, undergrounding electrical utilities, retrofitting infrastructure, um, so it's more resistant to hazards, improve, improving flood warning systems, home hardening, maintaining defensible space, and then of course public awareness and understanding of those hazards. Um, there's also a capabilities assessment that was added um, in this update um, to make sure that we're addressing FEMA's requirements for um, documenting our ability to um, reduce our risk through existing policies and programs. Um, so just a, a snapshot of the mitigation successes um, in our county since 2005. So um, the county's received over $4.3 million uh, in federal funds um, through the Hazard Mitigation Assistance Program. Um, and this has been really successful for us. So uh, to kind of wrap up here, the, the plan is really critical to guiding our work and um, the work that we do with community partners for hazard mitigation planning. And it's really just an important tool um, for us to look at and um, kind of point to projects and strategies that we know will reduce our risk to disasters and be collaborative in that effort. So we request that you move the approval of this plan to the consent agenda and I'll take any questions. Thank you. Commissioner West. Um, one of our more our most dangerous and front of mind disasters is wildfires. We um, all have a too recent memory of um, seeing those um, fires uh, kind of devastate a portion of our county just a few years ago. And we're always aware of it now, especially as the state's burning, <laughs> literally, uh, as we speak. Does our mitigation plan at all advocate or push specific policy that promotes forest land management, clearing underbrush, allowing sustainable harvest? Do you have anything with our mitigation plan that advocates for that, especially at the federal level, um, and trying to get the federal government to do its job to protect and maintain these vital resources in our community? Um, I didn't know if we could speak to that. Real quick, before Molly, I just want to acknowledge that Jay Wilson is in the back of the room, too, who Hi, Jay. also works on the uh, Community Wildfire Protection Plan. So okay. Molly, go ahead, but if we need, we could ask It's Jay just always the one right now, specifically just front yeah. of mind. And, you know, we've already had some fires in Clackamas, Chair. We, we've been communicating about that. You had a yes. scary one by your house. I hope it's 100% contained. I'm not totally mm -hmm. up to speed on that one. But we just have to put the, metal, the, the pedal to the metal on this advocacy on forest lands. It's a, it's a critical issue in our community. 
Yeah, let me, let me start by addressing it and then, yeah, Jay, definitely feel free to come on up if you'd like. Um, so our, in the natural hazard mitigation plan, um, the, the wildfire protection plan essentially serves as the wildfire section of our plan. And in that, uh, in that plan, there are identified mitigation strategies um, for, for folks to take, um, to take on, for the county to take on, and for individuals um, and property owners to take. So that process um, is sort of, that happened a little bit separately from this hazard mitigation plan update. Um, but yeah, if there's any other, I, Jay, if you want to come up, otherwise we can get information um, for you about specifically the question around forest fuels and advocating for federal lands. I just can't imagine a plan that doesn't directly address, you know, the one of the biggest issues we're worried about regarding this. So I'm not sure, I'm not totally convinced that that point, I don't know yet, but maybe it is, I'd like to know. Mm -hmm. Is it, is it addressed? Yeah, I think I, Jay, Jay Wilson, please come up. And I think this is an important question that needs, you know, a yay or a nay or a maybe <clears throat> or. You can do better or what do you? Good afternoon, Chair Smith and members of the Commission. Um, yes, as Molly said, the, the Wildfire Protection Plan has always been basically the proxy for the chapter for wildfire hazards in the county. Um, the U.S. Forest Service, uh, Bureau of Land Management are partners in our CWPP update process and they have direct action items related to their management of uh, wildfire risk and s especially since 2020, they've had stronger language around fuels reduction programs for, uh, for their lands. Um, and we're, we're in this process right now with the new Oregon uh, Department of Forestry wildfire hazard mapping that's currently in a public comment period um, that um, I think is, is front and center right now in the wildland urban interface areas. Sounds like you're talking more about the actual forested lands that they manage that may not be what would be applied by the Oregon Department of Forestry, if, uh, if that's correct. I, I want our policy to be, I mean, the forest lands don't care who's in charge, they just are catching fire. So whether it's ONC, whether it's state, whether it's federal, I want a really consistent, robust language around how we believe the right way to mitigate that is. I, in my opinion, this is all far too slow and a state is having tragic events happen across it right now. My family's been directly impacted by that, but I don't want to see Malala and Estacada and Canby evacuated again. There were real concerns just last week that there was a fire popping off in Canby. That's very close to the urban area. Um, I, but a lot of the policies that are in place have failed our natural resources and have put our communities in danger. I want us to like start to put language that's that speaks to those policies and really works <clears throat> at like dealing with all the chronic issues we've talked on this dice multiple times. I'm sure you're aware of Jay, um, but uh, I, I think that it has to be part of our plan. I think we have to continue to advocate for those policies, and I don't know what we need to do to be more aggressive or to be more loud. But I think we're there at this point, and I am concerned this fire season is not over. Lord knows what could still happen in our county. Well. I'll just say we're leaning very forward with our fire defense board in creating the Clackamas Wildfire Collaborative um, that we have uh, Title III funding going for uh, to support uh, the practitioner or the, the uh, what's the title? It's the Wildfire um, Collaborative Facilitator uh, for that program um, that we're trying to translate what we're doing on the Mount Hood corridor across the county, but most of those are all going to be in areas that are residential, uh, primarily that uh, that are in the wildland urban interface. I'll acknowledge uh, one of the challenges that we face, like all of the valley uh, communities, with the the designations from the Oregon Department of Forestry mapping, is that um, most of the funding is going to be directed towards high category wildfire hazards um, and um, most of that is what would be in central or eastern Oregon and uh, for the sake of the federal grants the community wildfire defense grants that the U.S. Forest Service has we've applied for in Clackamas County um, we haven't received uh, recent um, applications just because we're not considered high threat 
uh, as much as some of the other counties in terms of the, the number of parcels that we have that are categorized high mm -hmm. and in the wildland urban interface. And so the challenge that you're addressing um, is that most of those funds are going to be prioritized for other counties in the state uh, uh, rather than Clackamas County because we have a, a small fraction that meets the criteria for being considered high and in the wildland urban interface. Um, the FEMA grants that, that would apply towards the natural hazard mitigation that we have, uh, we can apply for those and those don't have the same restrictions that the U.S. Forest Service grants would have. Here's part of my concern with that whole statement you made. Commissioner Scholl and I recently this year, earlier this year, did tour the fire the, um, over there by um, Bull Run, which is the water supply for one of the largest cities in the United States, mm -hmm. in our county. And it looked pretty charred to me, and we got lucky. We got so lucky, the winds and the environment was just right, that we didn't contaminate one of the largest water supplies in the entire state. I've asked members of Congress and our delegation, when are we gonna prioritize defensive spaces in places like Bull Run, which is in our county, which is federal forest. I don't know if any efforts have been made there, but could you imagine if that actually contaminated the water supply? And don't think for a second it didn't almost happen, and we were all on pins and needles, and if we're still like, oh, you know, it's burnt, and it's not a priority because it's not what I, I mean, this is insanity. There are spaces in Clackamas County that I'm not convinced have been appropriately advocated for to have fire mitigation really happen. Bull Run is one of them. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that out of all the counties in the metro area, we had Estacada, Malala, just a couple years ago, completely evacuated when they were large urban areas, uh, rural urban areas. So I get what you're saying. The money is where it is, where it's designated. But I'm really, really concerned that it's not being prioritized correctly, that we haven't you know, really stepped up to the plate here uh, where we've needed to. If I could add. Uh, yeah, Jamie, go ahead. Apologies. Um, there is also the US Forest Service is working on a 10 year strategic plan process that they've just launched. They had a community meeting in uh, Welsh's and then they had a community meeting in Estacada. And they're looking at the whole entire Mount Hood area for that strategic plan looking for ways to, to mitigate that risk. So maybe we can uh, get you some more information on so that. They're just now planning. Like this, I mean. Uh, well, it's, it's a process that they, I think they have, um, they have some specialists that are on staff that they've hired to actually do more um, data, like analysis about the fuels. Do you know the time frame on this? It's a multi-year process that we're one of 10, I think, U.S. Forest Service areas that's gotten a high priority designation. Uh, they've just initiated that program, I think, in the spring of last year. So it's still early in getting okay. started. I just feel kind of, if you hear frustration on my voice, it's because maybe at the local level, when it's our communities burning, we feel a little or threatened. We feel a little bit more urgent than the federal government does in D.C. Um, but we are far past time study task force groups. Um, the lack of prioritization um, is, is, a, is really concerning. And so I, I hope that we can just have that in our policy moving forward. I don't mean to get too far tangential here, Chair, but I think we really need to be clear about our language in this plan. Thank you. Commissioner Shaw. Yes, well, uh, thank you for the briefing this morning, uh, this afternoon. I like your plan. I think it's a very good one. I think it's geared to address our existing potential threats to Clackamas County. What Commissioner West is talking about has more to do with uh, our fight uh, with state legislature and the federal government. That's what the problem is when it comes to management. So we have, we have, um, it's like, we have to react to the situation we have, okay? And that's to, that's to respond to this situation um, on our 500,000 acres of Mount Hood National Forest in this county and 93,000 acres of BLM land, 10,000 acres of ODF land, uh, just to respond to the situation we have to deal with. And what might be above our control at the county level uh, 
when it comes to management of these lands and management that could potentially in the future reduce fire threat, the fight, the concern there is um, the, the process at the state legislature and dealing with our federal government. And, and we get beat up all the time at the county level, the federal government especially. Have to, they have a, uh, there's a feeling that there's a lack of real regard for uh, the people who live on the land. So I like your plan, I think it's good. And I, but I think what Commissioner West is talking about is another plan, uh, another legislative plan to fight what's happening in Salem and to fight what's happening in Washington, D.C. Thank you. Commissioner Savas. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm okay with the plan. Uh, I think it's important, uh, as I listen often, uh, I think people conflate that uh, you know, these fires, these wildfires are all in our forest, but we gotta realize that um, brush fires, grasses, um, things like that, where there are no trees, are just as devastating um, and can go f quite fast as well, especially in wind-prone wind, uh, areas. So be mindful, I think, that more attention on this topic about defensible space and fuels is important, as well as recognizing that a lot of that sometimes is private property, it's not public property. So it's really not our role and our, we're not allowed to go on to private property uh, to create defensible space. Uh, we probably can go there to obviously to fight fires. But um, you know, I think sometimes we get consumed by um, everything being the forest or the trees and being BLM land, um, when in fact uh, our, some of our greatest vulnerabilities are what's around us. And then that's not BLM land right here, at least in the urban areas where the populations are. But I, don't, I guess, you know, just to be mindful that East, Eastern Oregon is struggling with this in forests as much as it is brush and fuel and grass. Oh, absolutely. Further comments on this? Is this informational only, or is there a motion? So we will put this on the consent agenda That's this right, week, consent. if you guys, if everyone is okay with that. Well, I want to thank you all for coming forward and making a very informative presentation. Uh, I think it's very timely. And thank you for answering our questions. Nancy. All right, Chair, I will turn it over to you for uh, Commissioner Communication. We're up next is Commissioner Communication. I'm going to forego my comments and wait for tomorrow since uh, we are running long. Any commissioner who would like to comment, go right ahead. Uh, Chair Smith, I would like to just say that I got a call from the management of uh, Timberline asking me to uh, go to Timberline next week on Wednesday to hear a briefing on their proposed plan of the gondola and parking lot oh. from government camp to Timberline. I'll go up there next Wednesday, Great. listen to it, and come back and report to you. That's very interesting. Commissioner West, do you anything? I am going to forego until tomorrow because we're over time. Commissioner Schrader. Me too. Commissioner Savas. I as well. Okay. See no further business before this commission. We are adjourned.